is 7 o'clock, and I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on August 19, 2024. First order of business is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? And I'll just note that uh, Mike Bard is joining us online. <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Recording in progress. I think yeah. that was my fault. Okay. Uh, okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The agenda is approved as written. Next item is the consent agenda. Um, just have one item. It's the minutes from uh, our last meeting on August 5th. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the <coughs> consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Aye. I think that was for the first one. <laughs> um, all right, now we have the public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warned agenda? Um, would be asked to please come forward, state your name, and please keep your remarks to limited to three minutes. Anything more than that, we'd be glad to enter into uh, an agenda on the ensuing meeting. No public comments today. As far as I can tell. All right, moving forward. Appointment to the Nat <coughs> Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. Uh, we have an application from Stacy Schwartz. Stacy, would you please come forward? Thank you for applying. Please have a seat. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, telling us why you're interested in serving on the committee and why you think you're uh, qualified to do so. Uh, sure. So I, my husband and I moved to Waterbury a few months ago. Um, my husband's on the conservation committee and um, just kind of want to get involved and contribute to the town. Um, that was the committee that was open, and I've done a lot of planning work in my career, not specifically emergency preparedness, but I've done a lot of public transportation planning and involved a lot of community outreach and all of that, so I feel like I have transferable skills to the uh, mm -hmm. emergency right. preparedness. Questions from the board? Okay. Um, I'll go first. We have a lot of natural disasters. <laughs> um, and we set up this committee to essentially figure out the best ways that we can possibly handle them. Um, and in your planning experience, do you have any, um, I'm trying to find the right word, do you have any knowledge when it comes to putting together volunteer teams? So, not directly, like I said, I've done like public outreach type stuff. So when we put in like new service, I'd be out there in the field like talking to people. Um, when you were putting a new service in, you'd have to get volunteers from like your department. Um, so related, but not exactly going out to the general community and pulling volunteers specifically. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm noticing on your resume, you've got a lot of, um, Work or done a lot of work with you know data analytics, data strategy. Do you see um, the use of those those skills on a um, disaster planning committee, or do you not know enough about the position yet? And that's fine to answer that way as well. I feel like data is always involved in yeah. everything, so I'm happy to contribute those skills if they are helpful. Anyone else? Alyssa. 
I was just saying, thanks for your enthusiasm. It's <laughs> great to see that you're really interested in getting involved. Um, I am struck, have you reached out to the town of Duxbury, given that you're a resident there in terms of their boards and committees? I know, I by policy, we that do they really have much of anything. Like, okay. I think Duxbury, there's basically, at least from what I can see, it's like the town clerk. <laughs> and then there's, I think there's like a, an emergency like person for each of the like areas, but that's like an boots on the ground, like, you know, you're gonna be like knocking on doors the night of like an emergency kind of thing, which wasn't what I was, <laughs> I wasn't looking to be quite that front and center. But yeah, I, I think we, both my husband and I looked into it, and it seems like that's very, like, I think kind of latches on to Waterbury for a lot of things, so. Your husband had a similar answer. <laughs> yeah. Mike, do you have a question? Mike? Yes, I do. Um, Stacy? Yep. I, I assume I'm unmuted. Um, I don't hear you Stacey, anymore. Stacy, your resume is very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Can you hear me now? We can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, very good. Maybe you can hear us. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, uh, again, your and your resume was very impressive. More so, I saw on the data side, right? on the practical science of natural resource uh, preparation in terms of uh, getting involved with disasters, could you say how your skills would transfer other than your, your data kind of skills? Uh, sure, so I before the data, uh, the data type of work, I worked in public transportation, um, which I, was, I guess I was mentioning before. Um, so it was a lot of planning, it was a different kind of planning. Uh, I was looking at planning new bus routes. Um, and, so, and when I was working for Metro North, um, I worked with a bunch of the different agencies uh, to plan out track outages. Those were planned track outages, not so much emergency, um, but dealing with a lot of different uh, entities to uh, make sure that everyone was aware of when tracks were out of service and how they could be taken out and how that might impact service. Um, and on the New York City Transit side, there was the bus planning, which involved sort of the community outreach part and also coordinating with different entities and organizations and people. Okay, thank you. Okay, right now the committee is writing a manual, pardon me, uh, writing a manual on volunteer efforts right after floodwaters recede and volunteers can enter houses to muck out. Mm -hmm. um, and they are also considering how they would best put together volunteer teams as the crew organization did uh, last three times around. Um, when it comes to manual writing, <laughs> Do you have any experience? Uh, yes, because whenever I like I've created not exactly software, but call it tangential to software, and I would have to document how things worked and how they could use it and the issues that would come up. So I've done a lot of that. Those those technical like technical writing, I've done a lot of that. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just uh, would second that, uh, that uh, getting that manual written and uh, would be a, a great accomplishment uh, for the committee. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing it as soon as it's ready to go. Um, what uh, is the uh, term of office? It's on the application. It's on the uh, Oh, it's very good. Stacy, you um. saved me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this would be uh, through ending in uh, April uh, 30th of uh, 2026. That's what it said in the uh, yeah. thing. Or actually, I think I, I emailed. I may have told her that. <laughs> may have known yes, I, I, I think you did, yes. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion? Unless you want more discussion. 
I move to appoint Stacy Schwartz to the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee for the unexpired term ending April 30th, 2026. Second. 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 Okay. All right. Any further discussion? I guess question for Kane on the structures. Have we considered having liaisons to other town? I mean, I'm, I'm really appreciating Stacey wanting to participate. We obviously are not swimming in other applicants, but I guess I am just aware of that. Was that on purpose? What? The swim part. <laughs> it's early Roger. We got a long night. Um, and, you know, I'm noting that, you know, Duxbury, for example, has an emergency management system with zone captains, and maybe that's something we could learn from and share. I know Kane has talked a lot of colleagues, so I'm just wondering, like, love me enthusiasm, do we think an appointment on the committee long term is the right fit, or is there a different way to leverage the enthusiasm? I mean, if we want to do it for now, I'm just being aware of that. Um, there's a lot of need and there is a lot of boots on the ground need after and just acknowledging that you are saying that's not necessarily um, what you're looking for maybe. I will say that living in Duxbury might have its perks to the committee as we would have representation from other towns and people who can communicate with the surrounding areas. But I mean if you do get cut off by the river. <laughs> uh, that would be problematic. Um, well, is, but I do, is the committee like, is the idea that you're out, like the main purpose is to be out there on the night or it's more we, of a plan? We have, purpose? we, in, in past floods, we have had committee members, um, I'm the liaison to the committee, um, we've had committee meet, members be boots on the ground. I've been boots on the ground. Everyone at this table, I think, who's on the select board has been boots on the ground. Um, mucking out basements so I guess you it doesn't disqualify you to not have experience in boots on the ground because you'll probably get it <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's no real expectation that people who serve on our, our committees have to go muck out basements um, but as this committee specifically it does help to have that experience um, at some point to be to be on streets that have been flooded and be in houses that have been hit by flooding. And I'm, um, I'm not. I'm certainly open to you know helping out. It's just the um, the zone captain is like you're, you're like really like an emergency like personnel. I, I don't want that kind of <laughs> responsibility, but I'm certainly happy to help you know people you know, get back to. The okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Is it mm -hmm. Okay. All right, the motion carries. Congratulations. Uh, welcome to the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee of Waterbury, Vermont. Thank, Thank you for setting forward. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Next on the agenda is the review of statistics and discussion of traffic enforcement and calming measures with Lieutenant uh, T.J. Howard. Uh, Lieutenant Howard is with us uh, online, I believe. So I'm hey, Roger, right. how are you? Good, T.J., how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, we appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Tom, do you have a, an intro on the statistics? Uh, sure. Why don't I why don't I pull up the junior the, the latest report we have? Okay. Which was for June. If I can share my screen, Karen. And these are on the town website to give a, a flavor. So the the left hand column is Waterbury troopers, and then the the other column is other troopers, but in Waterbury. So it's Mm -hmm. It's response by type, and we get this data monthly. There's always a bit of a lag. Um, this is uh, refers back to uh, June of this year. Yes. Yeah, so you have total calls. Um, then further down, you have some ticket information, and you have total arrests. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give a flavor, um, I actually believe the data is generally put over by Sally Dillon in her, in her day job. Uh -huh. um, and the one, um, 
I apologize, Tom. I meant to get you the ones for July before tonight. Uh, Sal did get them done on Friday before she left. And then I guess the one question that's been raised to me is, is there any way to have response times added to the data to see if there's some, uh, just some way to track that going forward? Uh-huh. And? We did talk about that. It's just such a, um, I wouldn't say it's subjective, because of course it's an objective number, um, but it's tough to try to cipher through all the data and give you a good representative number. So oh, oh. Um, if someone, I'm trying to think of an instance, you know, if there's a 911 hangout or something to that effect, of course, the amount of time it takes for a troop to get there is important. I think that number has some meaning. Um, but if someone has a late reported theft and it takes a period of time for the home, you know, the homeowner calls, they say that uh, something's happened at the residence. I'm out of town right now, but I'll be home in three hours and I'd like to meet you then. And, um, that would kind of skew the data one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that would just be a little time consuming to try to go through every call that occurs in the town of Waterbury to give you a good illustrative number. Um, if that makes any sense. That's the only reason that we've, uh, um, we haven't provided that with the stats every month. Mm -hmm. How many of these are 911 calls, TJ? That I don't think I could speak to. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to go back. So when each one of these calls is punched, it'll list whether or not it was uh, received via 911 or on the seven digit number. Um, that's certainly something that I could look into with Sal um, and provide to you guys. Yeah, I think maybe that would be a good start, and then uh, maybe okay. we can look at uh, whether the response time to 911. I think that's probably what most people might be most interested in. Is uh, you know, if it is indeed an emergency and gets called to 911, how quick is the response time for? Uh, okay those uh, officers assigned to Waterbury. Um, do you want to just provide us like an overview? Uh, we can see the statistics uh, from, from June here. Um, and uh, you know, there are a couple of things that uh, the high numbers that sort of pop out are uh, those things that are suspicious, uh, maybe uh, Citizen disputes at nine over the course of the month, uh, but maybe you could just provide uh, sort of an overview of your interpretation of, of the statistics and uh, what uh, your force is called called on to respond to. Uh, based sure. On what we um, see here. I would say kind of the numbers that you see are not atypical of the towns in Vermont. I think I figured in preparing for the meeting, the elephant in the room would be the fact that you can see that there are other officers responding to a number of calls in Waterbury versus the Waterbury troopers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of sugarcoating anything. Um, so it's, we are faced with some striking staffing challenges, particularly in Berlin. Um, so we're allotted 14 troopers uh, and then two, the two additional officers, the day shift and night shift trooper in the town of Waterbury. Uh, right now we're down five positions, so we're 35% vacant. Um, and so they are, we are certainly leaning into uh, the Waterbury troopers to help us um, just across the Berlin coverage area. Um, four of those are holes. One is one of our officers is out on um, admin duty. Uh, pending his review of the shooting he was involved in down in uh, Orange County. Mm -hmm. I've heard that, uh, you know, the, I believe the investigation is complete. We're just waiting to hear back for the review from the um, local state's attorney's office and then the attorney general's office. So my hope is that uh, in the near future, we'll hear back about the results of that and get him back to work. Um, if you guys didn't know, we have 14 troopers or recruits in the academy right now, uh, and I'm hoping by the end of tomorrow, if that's not too optimistic, we're going to hear back as to uh, how many, if any, are going to be assigned to Berlin. 
Um, of course, that's still pending them finishing the academy successfully and completing the field training pro uh, process. Uh, I would be shocked if we didn't get at least one, but I'm really hoping for two. Um, and I think that will help kind of normalize the staffing challenges that we're facing right now. Um, it will get back to kind of the traditional staffing levels that you guys deserve and expect in Waterbury uh, and not keep having to lean on May and, and Ryan to help us just try to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I was just wondering, do those vacancies... Uh, we just have to... Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, go ahead. No, I was just wondering, uh, do, those, do those, those five vacancies, is that uh, typical of uh, uh, barracks across the state, or is uh, Berlin particularly uh, down in terms of staffing? Yeah, so the department has, as a rule of thumb, tried to keep vacancies, the average vacancy, at 30% across all the field stations. Um, we are certainly hurting uh, more than some other offices. So Berlin, Westminster, St. John's Ferry, um, we're really looking to try to get a few people um, where we are currently. Um, so I wouldn't say we're we're far from what you see at other offices, but I do think that we're um, we're hurting more than some other stations currently. Okay. Okay. And in terms of the uh, types of uh, calls that we have, is that also representative of uh, of Vermont, or is there something in particular in Waterbury uh, that we should be paying? closer attention to? I don't think that I've seen anything uh, at Waterbury, or, or as the calls come in, seen anything that is atypical of other towns that uh, um, we have in our coverage area. Um, so there certainly haven't been noticeable trends that I'd be concerned about. Um, we hit a house a couple months back uh, in Waterbury that the Narcotics Investigation Unit was looking into. Uh, we have fielded a couple of complaints from citizens about other residences in town um, that we're trying to work on. Um, but, you know, that is a common trend amongst many of the towns that we cover. Um, and so we're just trying to make an effort to target some of the residences that are, are known to us and, and to the residents of the town um, and then do what we can there. Um, but sometimes that leads to a little bit of frustration because people want us to act right out of the gate and it normally takes a little bit of time uh, to sort those things out. But there's certainly some residences in Waterbury that we're, uh, we're currently looking into. Other questions from the board? Mike, do you have one? Yes, I have a question. First of all, Lieutenant, thank you for your service. Um, se secondly, I know drugs have become a significant amount of time that uh, the officers have had to spend upon. How have you seen in the recent few months uh, homeless complaints and dealing with homeless issues taking up uh, the troopers' times? And certainly there have been some people that have called in regarding people that are unhoused um, and there's we're trying to come up, up with what's the best plan um, to try to sort that out I think kind of as a community that's important right um, what are the accepted areas that the town is okay with people living in and what are areas that they're not uh, I know Trooper Murdoch had, had emailed me recently. Uh, I just have uh, reached out to Tom to sit down to see what would be the best way to address that. Because of course we want to try to find some sort of long-term solution for these folks. Um, but that's of course not easy here in Vermont. Um, I'll be curious to see as the weather turns to see how that changes. <clears throat> Typically people kind of migrate. Um, out of some of these areas because it's challenging of course as we all know to live uh, in Vermont in the winter time um, so maybe that might provide a good opportunity for us all to kind of sit down together um, and come up with a plan 
uh, for when the weather turns nice again come April. Um, but we haven't seen, I think, anything specific regarding increases in crime due to homelessness. I think it's more or less just people, um, well, I think a good example would be when Tom called and there were some folks taking uh, food from people volunteering in town, right? Um, and so that's something that just a good, honest conversation with folks is like that isn't necessarily for people that are unhoused, it's for the volunteers that are there, right? Um, and then just trying to get them in contact with, uh, with the appropriate resources. And I guess this would also be a good opportunity to tell you guys um, our office's embedded mental health clinician uh, that we've had for, well, the past couple of years. He just recently departed last week for a new job opportunity. Um, so that presents yet another hole at the office. I've been working with uh, Washington Mount County Mental Health, and I believe Karen posted the position today. So we're crossing our fingers that we get some nice qualified applicants for that. <laughs> but uh, if it helped with Nick Bruce, he was absolutely amazing, probably one of the best in the state. Um, so we're excited for him and his new opportunity, but it was tough to see him leave too, because um, that just is a, yet another challenge for the office. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. TJ, could you just uh, describe for us what uh, types of uh, service uh, Officer Roos would uh, provide for, for mental yeah, health Yeah, so Nick, Nick was awesome. Um, so every field station in Vermont has an embedded mental health clinician. Uh, they're basically um, contracted with the state police from the various designated agencies. So in Washington County, it would be Washington County Mental Health. Um, Nick's primary job is to uh, provide mental health services, um, get people that are experiencing some form of mental illness access to the Washington County mental health screeners. Uh, and basically it's more or less like a triage role to get people to more um, continuous care. Uh, but Nick really forged um, kind of like a, I wouldn't say a new role, but it's, you can kind of make, make it what you would like. And Nick was just really good at going beyond just the calls for service and when people are in need, he was a good way to facilitate people um, to various forms of services, whether it be people that are unhoused, experiencing mental illness. We had a woman out uh, in one of our more rural communities um, that was experiencing dementia and didn't have family uh, in the country. Um, and the continuous calls out there uh, was a drain uh, on our short shifts, but he was able to talk to the Council on Aging in the local community and find other people that were able to kind of fill that void where, you know, when she called, it really wasn't a crime that was being committed. It was just someone that was in need of services and they did a really good job getting her in contact with that. So um, it's, uh, it's gonna be a huge loss. We're just really hoping that um, some qualified people uh, apply and we can get through that process quickly and get someone kind of trained in that role. All right, thank you. Uh, Alyssa. Um, thank you for being here. The Some of the complaints we get most frequently are speeding and traffic calming, so yeah. recognizing the constraints you just shared. Um, I still don't know if you can just speak to kind of capacity, willingness, ability to do more traffic enforcement in the community? Uh, certainly willing. Uh, so my background, uh, prior to coming down to Berlin, I was on our uh, special operations. At one time it was called Traffic Safety Division of the Department. And uh, I basically investigated fatal crashes um, full-time around the state. So traffic safety is near and dear to my heart, uh, and speeding certainly is one component of that. Uh, the traffic safety triangle, as we always say, is uh, enforcement, education, and engineering. Um, so traffic enforcement, whether it be through um, education or enforcement, is hugely important. Um, and then, of course, engineering, I think, is equally as important, but that takes a lot of time, money, um, and commitment from the, um, you know, that's not a quick fix. Um, 
I think everyone's willing to do it. It's just a matter of um, finding the time. And I hate to say that. Uh, we're fortunate that Tom and people in town um, are willing to reach out about concerns that they've had. I think the last one that we spoke about was some speeding down by um, Cold Hollow and uh, kind of the Route 100 corridor in the village up there. Um, that's easy to kind of get that information out to Ryan and May, uh, just to put it on their radar to try to do some enforcement in that particular area. Um, so if there's certain spots in town, I think it's good to communicate that back and forth so I can get it out to them. Um, it's just trying to find the time. And I, I hate to say that to people because it sounds kind of uh, like a broken record. Um, but today, the shift was me, uh, the kid that just got off field training, and then two troopers from St. John's Ferry. So um, trying to get a shift full of people out to do some of that can be a challenge. So I just, I really do hope that we're gonna get a few more people and there's gonna be light on the horizon. Um, I think I'm just uh, asking for people's patience while we try to bolster some of those numbers. Um, calls for service generally go down in the winter time. Uh, we'll see an increase in crashes and slide offs. Um, but that's normally an opportunity for people at the office to regroup and do a little bit more targeted enforcement, in my experience. Uh, <coughs> two roads that, from which we've uh, received complaints include Maple Street and Neyland Flats. Uh, Tom may have already relayed those to you, but uh, those are two that, that I know of that uh, we've received complaints about people regularly speaking okay. on. And I'm sure if we open it up to the audience here, we'll get some more. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you want me to come up or I'm fine here. Chris, could you mind? No, yeah. I can't hear you. Come back there. Hi, Lieutenant. Thanks for uh, speaking with everybody here tonight. Uh, I spoke with a gentleman yesterday on a project. Yeah, thanks, uh, on a project um, who happens to live. I'll, I'll put it this way, have to live near one of these drug houses. Um, yep. Very upset about what's taking place, the fact that your efforts, Vermont State Police, to remove this drug house and be done with it um, are actually getting nowhere. Uh, and I'd just like to know what what's the roadblock is it the policies that you're having to deal with that are causing the problem is it something within the judicial system that's exasperating your efforts uh could you and 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 is the fact that it's making it so difficult to deal with this type of situation exasperating the problem, the drug problem, even more as time goes on in Waterbury and other communities? Sure. Um, so I just slapped the week before uh, the governor came down and spoke with local law enforcement and local community leaders down at the Bill Building in Berlin um, to kind of get a feel for what are some of the common trends that we're seeing uh, across Vermont. Uh, and drug use and drug dealing was a point of conversation that came up. Um, I don't think it's necessarily fair to point fingers, but I think that um, anyone that's intimate with the criminal justice system knows that um, there are some challenges in Vermont. Uh, I think some of the biggest issues lie in the court system itself. Um, so even if we do a really good investigation, uh, are able to develop probable cause, take someone into custody, the state's current office charges them. More often than not, um, they're just going to be released again with conditions of release to stop doing what they're doing. Um, and in many instances, not just with drug use, but with other crimes, people um, violate those conditions. They're arrested, they're charged with violating those conditions, they're issued more conditions that they then go and violate once more. So. Um, I think for, at least recently, I, I honestly believe that the target isn't necessarily on our back. I think people recognize that the police um, in our department are out there affecting the arrest the best they can. 
um, but we're just one cog uh, in the chain. And so then we send these cases up and they get charged and then uh, I don't necessarily keep track of where they go through the criminal justice system. Um, but that, I think, is kind of where some of the issues lie. Uh, and we as a department have kind of taken a stance now that I'm certainly open to feedback and we're certainly not perfect as a department and we have room to do better. Um, but if these concerns are genuine, uh, it's really imperative for folks to reach out to their um, state reps and their senators and make it known that this is a problem because uh, I think many people are frustrated. We just did a search warrant not that long ago down in Williamstown, uh, and that was charged on a federal level, um, and we're still having issues down in Williamstown. So it's, um, it's an ongoing problem. I don't think that I have the answer. All I can say is the, um, if there are issues or homes that are problematic, continue to provide that feedback. Um, either emailing me or there's a, a VT tips that you can do on the department website um, and then we can try to take it from there. Um, but I don't think that we're going to be the total solution. There's certainly other players involved in the, in the process, whether it be the state attorney's office or the judicial system. Thanks. Uh, one last quick question. Uh, Sure. Back when I was on the board, there was 15, when, when, the, when the barracks were down here in Middlesex, there were 15 officers covering 18 towns. Now you're in Berlin, you say you've got 14 officers, including, or not including the two from Waterbury, so that would make a total of 16. Are you still, are you still having to cover what would be 17 towns now because the two are here in Waterbury? Are you at 17 towns with 14 officers? Or? So we still have the same coverage area, which is the whole county of Washington County, and then we cover uh, Williamstown, Orange, and Washington down in uh, Orange County. So, uh, yeah, same same large coverage area, just with a few less people. Thanks much for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. For your service. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have a question for uh, Lieutenant Howard? All right, TJ, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming forward and uh, look forward to uh, talking with you again. Thank you, Roger. Uh, please reach out anytime. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or concerns people have. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Yep. Hmm? I'm going to chat with Woody at all as yeah. part of our the, 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 the triangle that was in for me. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Well, uh, May I ask you a question? Uh, sure. Teacher. Teacher. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, so, who is the, who's been on the board the longest? How many years? Uh, Mike. Mike? Where's Mike? Was oh, he the one up there? Too. And how many years has he been here on the board? Uh, Mike, you have to answer the question. Five, I think. Five years? Five or something. Okay. And then everybody else, like three and under years, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Curious. Uh, we'll get back to the agenda. Um, so after, yeah, after COVID, then every after COVID, did things change as far I, as? I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're interested, but this is not how this okay. works. Okay. We so, follow the agenda. Okay. okay. Sorry. And the agenda, next on the agenda is uh, the future of Shaw Mansion Road. Um, hmm? Have Woody first with the triangle. Yeah, we can have Woody first uh, with the uh, triangle. So, Woody, would you mind coming share? Woody with the triangle. Woody with the triangle. Woody with the triangle. So, uh, we want him to address the uh, safety triangle. Um, yeah, the last thing we had a pretty broad ranging conversation about traffic calming measures. Mm -hmm. um, at one point there was a proposal, I think, for a series of um, mm -hmm. speed bumps or speed humps. Um, and we, um, several people said we're happy to have that conversation, but let's bring Woody in on that. But I think there was some focus on 
speed bumps or speed humps on Maple Street, a um, couple other streets, but then also are there some longer term traffic comfort measures we can do along with some of those streets to you know, re-engineer the, the road a little bit um, mm -hmm. and somehow just change, you know, you can, whether it's medians, but sometimes it's striping, sometimes it's roadways, you can, you can create a natural effect on people to slow down. Right. So we thought, let's, let's have Woody opine on that a little bit and, and further our knowledge and before we start suggesting to the public works director that there's been a vote to have four speed lines on the road. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, happy to talk about it. Um, what, not directing it towards any street in particular, but um, I think the first step before we go anywhere, whether it's Neal and Flats, Maple Street, um, what have you, I think the first step you have to go to is to get some data to see if speeding is an actual problem or is it a, is it a measurable problem or is it a perceived problem? Um, I know when you're standing on the side of the road, it seems like everybody's driving fast. In particularly on Maple Street, there are no shoulders, uh, there are no sidewalks, so everybody who's walking a baby, jogging, biking, is in the roadway. So it, it seems like to everybody, when a car goes by you, it's, you're going quite fast. Um, the speed zones on Maple go from 25 to 30 to 35, so um, it's all properly signed. Um, we paved the road a few years ago, so it, you know, it rides much better. Um, normally those speed complaints all come after we've paved a road and it gets a little, you know, um, a little more smooth ride and people like to drive it fast. But I think whatever street you would like to focus on or whatever you'd like to do, I think the first step would be to get some data as to what is the average speed, what's the 85th percentile speed, which is what they go by when they set speed limits as to are the speed limits posted on these roads, the proper speed limits, which in most cases I'm gonna say they probably are, um, and if they are, then does it become an enforcement thing or would you like to progress towards some sort of traffic calming that would slow people down? And do you have the, um uh, the equipment to measure those speeds? We do not, but uh, working with Central Vermont Regional Planning, we can we can get it done. I know they have a full slate, usually of, they work for every town in the region. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you wanted some data, we did some data earlier this year um, in preparation for road maintenance. Yeah, yeah um, not necessarily even looking at speeds, but we have that data available. Um, but if you wanted to give me a target areas of Maple, Neeland, where you'd like to shoot for, um, they probably could fit it in this fall, I would guess. Yeah, I think what I, I've heard Maple more than other yeah. uh, complaints, so I'd, so I'd say that would probably be target number one. If yeah. get it the, the, the citizens of Maple Street are certainly vocal. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you know, if, if there are others, uh, we would welcome other comments uh, to come forward. I'm sure I'll, yeah. I hear lots of comments, but yeah. to, uh, all right, here, Blush Hill. Blush Hill. But it's, I think to some extent, it's going up or going down. Um, but I think to some extent, it's tied to the spring where there's a sudden increase in traffic as people use the boat end, especially. Yeah. And so the trucks, trailers, boats are noisy and it yeah. gives the impression. Um, one thing I just want to know too, when the, when the traffic study is done, you know, we refer to the 85 percentile, but, you know, in essence, what your traffic study simply understands average speeds, and there's a bit of an assumption when you do it that the average person drives reasonably and doesn't have a death wish. So sometimes your traffic study can say, you know, this road is posted for 30, the average speed is 45, in fact, it's low. Yeah. And the speed limit should be revised upward. And that does happen Good go back. just as often as it's revised downward. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't you don't automatically get to have a traffic study that says well, average speed is 45 because if you want it to be 30. Mm -hmm. There's you know, there, there's a process to follow here and it's not just a whim per se. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I will say, what was it, a couple years ago when we did Stowe Street and Stowe Street was a hot button speeding <coughs> issue area. I haven't heard much about Stowe Street. 
Um, we did narrow the lane widths on that with some white fog lines and what have you. And whether that worked or you know the troopers sitting there on the flats worked, I, you know, it's hard to say. You know. Have you tried the, that uh, the, those narrowing the white lines on the sides uh, on any other streets? We have not. No, no. A street like Maple has no white fog line. Why is uh, that? Um, the state does yellow lines for us. It's a class two highway. They don't do the white fog line for that road, um, as they wouldn't for Union Street or Blush Hill or yeah. You know. I mean, you can do it. We could pay to have it done if mm -hmm. if if. Didn't we do the white lines on uh, Stowe Street? We did it on Stowe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, that's why I'm, I think that may have had an impact there, narrowing yeah, that one. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And my son doesn't speak on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, so if the data, you know, shows perhaps there is a speeding issue on Maple or Neyland, we can, of course, we could try the simplest solution, which might be narrowing the lanes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's and an I easy think, one. And I think we don't get complaints on Cupto because the bridges are narrow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That does a nice job of slowing people. Yeah. Uh, Ian. Is there, yeah, um, white fog lines sounds like a great traffic calming measure. Are there others that um, that you would suggest? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they have some wavy yellow lines or, you know, where it widens out, um, you know, going short of speed bumps, humps, yeah. and tables. Um, there's some work you can do with line striping. That's the first, I think, the first yeah. course of action. Other questions? Is it a um, budget decide for a minute if the money is there? Is there a time to perhaps do that this summer? The white lines? Uh, we just did our yellows the other day. Um, it, it's it's hard. They 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 do quite a business when the pavement's dry. You know. Um, they know they want to come in and do an entire town. No, I mean we were fortunate. Mike LaRock walked all of Stowe Street with a walking machine painter, and it did all of Stowe Street for us. I mean, you certainly could do it that way. Um, Mike doesn't like the hills, you know, so. Yeah, Maple Street might be the well, challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could. He probably would do it for us. He probably would. Do you think? Uh, you know, you said the first order of business was to get the data. Yeah. Um, do we have just an, enough uh, complaints and uh, other data to merit? Uh, Putting in white lines on Maple Street, uh, or would you suggest that we get the data first and then do the lines? I think we can get the data reasonably quickly. Um, I think it's probably best maybe to progress with both at the same time, knowing that it's going to take a couple weeks for the data. Mm -hmm. may, it may take a couple months for the lines if they happen at all. Mm -hmm. But um, we could have like a study if uh, we had the data before the lines and then yeah. after the yeah, lines. Yeah, that's it. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hey. This might sound dumb. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, adding a bike lane on Maple mm -hmm. would that slow traffic? Yeah, I think anything that narrows the roadway, yeah. in theory, is going to slow traffic. Um, really? You know, you can look back, Skip's here, your local historian, but Maple Street had sidewalks years ago. Not in my time, but uh, way back. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, so. <coughs> so, but on that note, um, in the spring of 2023, the town applied for what was called a Better Connections Grant for Waterbury Center and then traffic calming pedestrian improvements would have been part of that study. The grant wasn't funded. Um, um, Katie Galbraith and the Planning Committee and Duncan McDougall um, are both um, hard at work already on reapplying for the spring of 25 uh, for that grant. Mm -hmm. So I think some of those ideas could perhaps be incorporated into that. And that's come up already. Mm -hmm. 
Accidents for speeding. Any deaths and accidents? I can't say that there's been a lot, but since uh, 2017, the state considered Guptal a high risk rural road, an HRRR, and they um, proposed new signage, uh, new line striping, um, a few other changes for Guptal. Not necessarily for deaths, but for traffic accidents. Mm -hmm. Well, so, there's been a lot of traffic accidents on there. I, I think more so than, other, you know, Maple Street doesn't have a long history of traffic accidents, okay. but Guptal a little more. Because I've, I've driven Guptal eight years, and um, I've not seen an accident yet, but I'm curious to know why we would spend money on that um, if there's not a lot of accidents or, um, you know, deaths, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand when people are standing there and a car goes by 40 miles an hour, it seems fast. But. Let me, uh, yes. uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want you to, be, just so that we all understand how, how these meetings work. Um, I recognize the speaker here, and he speaks to the board. And then if other people want to speak, they raise their hand. Oh, I'm sorry. And then I, I, I recognize sorry. the speaker. I apologize. Okay. Roger. You're welcome. I apologize. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Oh, Mike. Mike? Mike? <laughs> Mike, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you have to unmute Mike. Sorry about that. Uh, when you're suggesting about data, uh, that you need data, you're not, are you suggesting that we need a full traffic study? Because I know some of those traffic studies can be extremely expensive. No, I'm, I'm simply speaking to a, what the Central Vermont Regional Planning can do with a traffic counter for us, which would tell us number of vehicles, okay. time of day, speed, number of axles, um, those, those sort of things, Mike. Because I remember when they did that traffic study of the Route 100 corridor, that was quite expensive, you know, and involved quite quite a bit of work. But I appreciate that input, Bill. Um, I'll just uh, another traffic uh, calming uh, issue that came up was the installation of uh, those flashing signs, uh, and when we uh, discussed having one put in uh, on either side of Main Street, one close to the uh, railroad trestle down here, and another at the other entrance of town uh, towards the bridge. Um, and those are on order? Those are in. The temporary yeah. ones are, are in. They get rotated out when the batteries go dead. Um, oh, th those are just the, uh, the ones that yes. they, they are driving too fast. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And that was my understanding of what you wanted. If you wanted something permanent and or um, more extensive, I guess. I, I need to be directed that way. I guess. Okay. Yeah, and we have quoted out the the more the more permanent flashing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was pedestrian signals. thinking of those pedestrian signals where the pedestrian comes up, hits a button, and then the flashing light goes on to uh, alert the traffic that someone's trying to cross, and then they're more yes, to stop. I did speak with East Coast Signals, who does that sort of work about those. Um, in both applications, they most likely would have to be solar. You know, just it works a little better that way, yeah. closer to with what have you. Um, and he actually looked at every crosswalk location in town. You know, the you know right from here all the way to the Pro Pig to <coughs> you know Foundry Street to. Um, by the Catholic Church, yep. you know, so yep. all those crosswalks. Yes, yeah. Yep. So um, that wouldn't be cheap. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah certainly a concern. It's a twenty twenty five budget conversation. I think. Okay, for all of them. Because I, I, I was under the impression that we were going to uh, get started with two of them, yeah. uh, but if uh, we don't have it in the budget, uh, that's fifteen inch per hmm. fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand per per, uh, per sign per flashing light per light. Yeah, not nothing. 
Okay. Other questions for Woody? Do you want to stick up here for the shot man? Sure. Yeah. All right. Then we can proceed to the shot mansion. Um, to the future of Shaw Mansion Road. Uh, we'll make it a quick yes, second overview. Right. So the the day of the flood, the day the day after the flood. Um, I'm speaking now back in. Yep, sorry. So the day of the flood, the day after the flood, and speaking with with Woody and, and Celia, who's the the poor person. The immediate priorities were opening roads where people were stranded. Um, making sure people could leave their driveways, making sure everyone had a way in and out of their home. Um, so Shaw Mansion, in the very short term, was put on the back burner because um, it's a relatively short distance around um, for residents. It's relatively short distance around for emergency services. I think, um, well, I know, I remember the select board meeting immediately after the flood. Gary Dillon was here, the fire chief, and, and Maggie Burke was here, the ambulance chief, and they just said they're not concerned about the impact of emergency services given the, the length of the road. So we, we began um, to have the conversation and sort of the idea of keeping it closed on a permanent basis. Um, if it is repaired, the, the culvert is reusable. Uh, there is quite a bit of fill that would need to go into the hole. Um, there has been, over the years, I understand, quite a bit of money spent on repairs, nothing of this magnitude, but, but consistent, more minor washout issues, so there's an ongoing expense. If it is repaired, it is a FEMA eligible project once a declaration is made, so it would be 75% reimbursed. So it's not necessarily a budget buster to fix it, but the real question is, um, is this a climate adaptation strategy for the town to acknowledge it's going to be a challenging spot in the future? It has been in the past and consider discontinuation. Um, so the select board can say today simply fix the road. Public works will fix the road. Mm -hmm. uh, if the select board wants to continue dis dis wants to consider discontinuation. Um, there's a legal process, and, and that starts with a, a meeting has to be set. It is a site visit, and it's a little bit similar to a DRB hearing in the sense that all the abutters have to be legally <coughs> notified, certified mail. So my advice to you is if you want to set that meeting to set it two months from now, because we've got to take the time and make sure we follow the law uh, to the letter, uh, because this is one of those cases where some residents might appreciate the road being closed, some might not, and if you don't follow the exact procedure, you will not survive a court challenge. Mm -hmm. um, once a site visit occurs, the select board would have 60 days to make a decision, and that decision is not based on arbitrary reasons. Again, there's well-established, uh, there's a wall here and there's well-established precedent about uh, that, that lays out the process and what factors the select board is to consider in the decision making. Um, that being said, I believe, having spoken with council, that the, the basic factors we talked about, which are financial challenges in the future of maintaining it and, and just operational challenges, is probably a reasonably valid basis to consider the conversation. So mm -hmm. there's my overview. Sorry, it was a little more than 30 seconds. <laughs> no, no problem. No. Uh, and uh, Ken and I went down and took a look at it today. It is a, a sizable uh, erosion of material uh, around that culvert uh, that got taken out in the uh, July flood, as I understand it. Uh, it does look like the town has stockpiled uh, a significant amount of fill to, to repair it uh, already. Um, but uh, Woody, if you would have an update as to what you've done since the flood in that area, that would be helpful. Yep. So um, <coughs> as Tom mentioned, the first concern was we could just shut that road down and go on business as usual. Um, it's, it's a much different situation than Greg Hill Road, where the culvert itself was horseshoed and bent and not usable at that point. Um, after we had a better look at Shaw Mansion, it appears that the culvert is still good, albeit perhaps undersized in today's world. Um, 
and it will recall, re, it'll need you know several hundred yards of material. Um, we had the opportunity to utilize some material uh, from Henry Huff Road that had washed down onto Mike Hedge's lawn. You know stuff like <laughs> stuff like that. That's decent material, not necessarily what you want for your top of your road and your road base. But mm -hmm. as you can see from that hole, it needs a lot of material. Um, so the decision was made to whether we're fixing it or not. We're still going to fill the hole, I would assume. Um, mm -hmm. So we started uh, utilizing some trucking local guys, and we've hauled down some material there. Um, it would be my recommendation that you know we're not looking at a quarter million dollar project like Greg Hill. You know, um, we're looking at fill and you know an excavator and some specialty work there to build up the head wall, et cetera. Um, and it can be done. It's not a long time frame to do it, um, mm -hmm. you know. So if the board chooses to have it done, we can have it done. And if the board chooses to close it, we will just push that material into the hole, and road close signs will go up. Uh, we will have to, you know, build a turnaround on the other side for a plow truck because we have to come down to there is plow, a, plow that side. A driveway on the far side. <clears throat> yeah. So the south side of the dip. We'd have to stop at Evergreen. That side would be fine, but the plow truck would have to come down in the bottom on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'll take my direction from the board. But it would, I think I, I'm leaning towards I, I would open it back up. Uh, it's not an expensive fix um, when you look at other things. You know, um. And one, thing, one, one oddball challenge with that road is if there's a history of damages, there's a very good chance FEMA is going to would pay for an upsize culvert. Mm -hmm. um, there's some history of damages there, but not to this extent. So I suspect FEMA will certainly pay to, to redo the road as is and do some armoring of the of the culvert, but they're not going to pay for a new culvert. Yeah. What are the history? What is the history? Of, uh, um, uh, yeah, in my time, it has it had a lot of history. I mean, the water topped the road. You've been here. How many years? No, 35. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like everything, it's, it, you know, some debris got in the inlet and that caused it to go over, and that seems to be what was happening. Um, Is but, that what happened this time? The clock? I, I believe so. Yeah, I mean, whether there's too much water, if it was fully open or not, I can't say, but most likely, if you look at what roared down through there, most likely something clogged it. Yeah. Well, it came fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, if there were if there were no houses down in the dip, if you know Valley View was the end and Evergreen Woods were the end back 20 years ago, it would have been a much easier decision, I think, to close it. You know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, um, yeah, I'd like to get uh, more input at least tonight uh, yeah. just to see what other people are thinking. Uh, but go ahead, Kane. Yeah, I would like the opportunity to ask the community who came here tonight: Who is here over this issue? Over this issue. This issue. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like uh, at least uh, about 15. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I just wanted to get a read. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it seems just uh, on the face of it as being uh, something that is not insurmountable to fix. And uh, I know in the past I've heard that it was closed in the winter uh, because it's steep and difficult to plow probably. Uh, but uh, that's been several years ago, I believe. Uh, would you have any concerns about reopening it uh, from an operational basis? No, I mean, uh you know, the truck, whether you close it, the truck goes down to the bottom anyway, you know, so on the other side, um, you know, um, in, in my mind, you know, you put a lot of Loomis Hill Bridge keeps all of these people coming this way now. Um, if, you know, I'm not saying Loomis Hill Bridge is going to wash out, but <laughs> if that does, you know, you know, who knows? Yeah, I think it's, it's a cheap enough fix that I think we should do. I, you know, inexpensive enough, and that who's to say the next big storm doesn't wipe it out? But if it wipes it out, wrecks the culvert, then you've got a 
bigger problem. Tougher decision to make, I think. Right. Okay. Um, anyone feel like uh, taking more testimony on this? Uh, or uh, would you like to uh, just uh, move oh, to the have an opportunity to speak? Yeah. Hmm? Does the public have an opportunity to speak? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, I'll take uh, comments from, from the public. Thank Raise you. Your hand. Yes, and please come forward. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Paul Arno. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> interestingly, I actually contacted the was contacting the town about the uh, the speed limit, the dip. Right. Um, and I, I copied you. I don't know if you copied the rest of the yep. select board, but there's a there's a 22 percent grade on the north side and a 15 percent grade on the on the uh, south side. And you've got a 35 mile an hour speed limit through there right now, which is uh, far too high uh, given the, uh, the geometric conditions. That is, you can't see anything. When you come up that 22% grade, you're not seeing anybody coming the other way and vice versa. You're not seeing anybody. And I myself, with my grandchild, have uh, myself twice, uh, have been passed by cars that don't even see you. It just, it, it's, it, you're not visible. That's where I started. Um, and then after the road shut down, um, I'm on Shaw Mansion Road biking or walking, as is my wife, and there's a noticeable decrease in, in traffic. Uh, the point being is that Shaw Mansion is used uh, quite often, it appears, as a, uh, as a through road. And, and the, the curious thing about that is, is that it's actually shorter if one is using Shaw Mansion to cut across the Neyland Flats and then to um, the intersection of Guptill and Route 100 the traffic lights. It's actually shorter to go down Loomis Hill than it is to continue on through Shaw Mansion. So, um, I, so that that puzzles me why why people are doing it because it's a terrible road. I mean, the the, the dip is. Uh, right. You know, that, that dip, it, it will be graded one day, and within two to three days, it's, it's chewed up. Um, and, uh, um, Not true. Well, I, I live there, I think it's true, but I won't argue with you. Um, Wait, but we're, we're, again, yeah. we have one person speaking at a time. Yeah. Um, so what, what I look at here is, um, is I look at, yes, you can fix the road. Um, I think it's bound to happen again. I think Woody, you may have forgotten uh, Irene. Um, it's my understanding that, that culvert got wiped out and Irene had to be had to be repaired. Um, that coming from Chris. Chris the ends, he's the one who repaired it. So, okay. Well, so it's not gonna dispute that. So no, no, I have not forgotten yeah. Irene. No, no, no <laughs> but yeah, just, so I'm, what I'm all I'm suggesting is that there have been other instances when, yeah. when it has been a problem. But my, my I guess my main point is this is that um, I look at it as an opportunity to, to create a, uh, a more user-friendly road. It's, it's a, it's a uh, opportunity that before the board that I don't think would come again, unless the next time it's wiped out. But um, it does create a situation uh, on, on both sides where it is a much more pedestrian-friendly area. And that road is used heavily by pedestrians. Um, a lot of bikers, a lot of runners, um, and uh, um, walkers. But just, I, I, I understand Woody's concern that if he lost uh, Loomis Hill, there'd be a problem, but there are, I mean, you're talking about the difference between the end of Shaw Mansion and coming up over Ripley Road, so there, there are options. Um, and the other thing is, is that I know, and I'm sure there are people who probably talk about the inconvenience, um, so I just did a little quick data. I don't want to take up, you know, monopolize the time here. But um, you know, the inconvenience, and I'm using the Gupta Road Route 100 intersection as a kind of demarcation point. Uh, as I said before, it's shorter. It's 3.9 miles going Loomis Hill Road to that intersection. It's 4.2 miles if you continue on through Shaw Mansion. Um, Thurston Lane is just about even, 4.1 versus 4. Worcester View, um, it is uh, eight tenths of a mile further if you have to go to the <coughs> Valley View um, back over to Loomis rather than going straight through. 
from my house, I, I am a mile further out um, because I'm very close to the dip, so I am con inconvenienced. But um, I would trade that inconvenience for a uh, for a, for a road that is much more pedestrian friendly. So, are you advocating uh, to close it up? I am. Okay. I mean, the conclusion I have is that it's likely to blow out again, um, and uh, by not repairing it, you just you gain a more pedestrian friendly uh, uh, road. Each side of the dip. So other questions for uh, Paul? Okay. Uh, yeah, Tom. Just wondering for Paul or even Chris if you recall if, in Irene the extent of the, the washout that occurred. Was it similar to what happened? Similar, yeah. Okay. Almost identical. Okay. A little bit worse on the uphill side uh, on the shoulder above the top, you know, headed up, Sean mentioned. But that sounds like that's really it, just these two instances. And the yeah, I, I'm not that sure. I, and I'm sorry, to, I don't know if I can continue for a moment, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the, well, totally the culprit. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the damage, it's it's actually water coming down into the dip. The culvert is certainly a part of that. But if you look at the damage coming down from the south side, it's it's there's a lot of water that comes mm -hmm. down that and yeah. then blows it out. Was, uh, eroded on the... Uh, yeah. West side of the exactly. road. Exactly. So again, that yeah, I uh, I just think there's there, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic on that road. There's an opportunity that by closing it, you create a more pedestrian friendly environment. And I don't think the inconvenience factor is is terrible. That's obviously my opinion. But I do thank the board for taking the, taking the time and letting us let us speak. Certainly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Chuck. Uh, Chuck Voltaire, I live on the uh, intersection of uh, Valley View and Shaw Mansion Road. And we've been there over 34 years now, and as far as I remember, it was only washed out once. Or, and I don't remember which stump it was. But uh, there seems to be that there's been more development up in that neck of the woods, certainly on Shaw Mansion. But I think there that's become a thoroughfare, and I don't care what the mileage says, but when I'm going down to the village when the road was open in the summertime, it was a quicker way to go down to develop. It was a more direct line. Um, but yeah, the point has been more and more developed. It's become, a, uh, I think, an important route for that whole Loomis Hill section to come on down into the village. Uh, and in terms of recreation, all those roads are being used. A lot more bikers, a lot more hikers. And, and I've seen washouts on Valley View, or at least the uh, what do you call it? water damage on Valley View is not much worse than it is on, on the uh, on, on Shore Mansion, and actually the corner of Valley View, we've always had washouts across from my house that's constantly washing out and it's not drained out properly. And that that's happened no more frequently than I've noticed in the dip. Um, but yeah, to me, the, the bottom line is the word is there, it's being used. If it's going to be not used, it's got to be a good reason for that. I think people who bought property, bought homes, and are using that because it works for them. And what, what would your preference be? Uh, to keep it open. I mean, personally, I remember the days when the dip was closed. It was a great uh, sledding place to go and less traffic for us. But, you know, it's also a thoroughfare that we used to. In all fairness, I think we're going to take that away from that whole section of the community. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a good reason for it rather than just, you know, inconvenient or whatever. Okay. Particularly if the fix is, is, is not onerous at this point. Okay. Questions for Chuck? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Chuck. Uh, others? We'll look up online. Anyone? Melissa Jordan. Uh, Melissa Jordan. Hi there. Uh, I live on Valley View. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I live on Valley View, and you know I've noticed that there's been a little uptick in traffic. You know, albeit very small, and everyone's been very respectful. Um, however, I just want to mention that it's important to have another way to get around during mud season. Uh, the mud situation isn't always equal yeah. on Valley View as it is on Shell Mansion. Sometimes Valley View's been worse, um, and we just need to be able to distribute the traffic multiple ways out of here for all of the residents. Um, I hadn't really thought about it until it was mentioned before about the Loomis Hill Bridge. Last summer, the Beavers made a home, mm -hmm. and the town would forget to that dam 
days before last summer's flood. If not, we probably would have lost that bridge. Uh, the, the dam was quite large. They're very busy. So, you know, just thinking about all the different scenarios that there are, it would be helpful to keep it open. So I'm for keeping it open. Got it. Questions for Melissa? All right, thank you. Others? Yes, sir. Darren Jones. I've lived in, up on Shaw Mansion my whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, right above Worcester Mountain View. I agree with what she says. Valley View and Shaw Mansion, uh, the upper <coughs> part of Shaw Mansion for me. Mud season. Terrible. I also have my parents are, my dad's 90 years old. Bob Jones, mm -hmm. and my mother is 88. There's been times recently that I've been called, that I'm getting out of work, that dad has fallen down, mom can't help him get up. Right. The dip was always a way for me to get home a lot quicker, instead of going all the way through the traffic, Route 100, or up the road, and all that. Well, I mean, I had to go up the road, but the other, right. the long way that way. So, like I say, I've lived here my whole life on that road. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to keep it open? Yes. Okay. How's your dad doing? He's doing good. Is he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, he's Question okay. for Darren. No, I'm just keeping a tally yeah. for okay. and against. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, right. Darren. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> uh, I guess we could. Um, let's, uh, unless, uh, yes, ma'am, come forward. Um, I'd like to say one reason I'd like the dip uh, to stay. I'm sorry, could you just state your name, please? Laura. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say one of the reasons I would like it to stay open is Shaw Mansion turned into a slime pit as soon as there's any rain on the road, and it never gets fixed. Sometimes I can come through the dip and get closer to my house so I don't have to walk as far. And I was so pleased with the job that was done when the new culvert was put in, and I believe this is a, a really fluke thing that it washed out, because you guys put in a huge culvert, and you reinforced it all around, and. I'm not an engineer. I'm guessing that it should have been reinforced a bit more where the water comes in. Um, the banks, more rocks, more stones. But I'm guessing. I'm not an engineer. Um, and um, sometimes in the winter, Loomis Hill is so bad I am not able to get home because it's so icy. And for whatever reason, the dip, I don't know if it's because it's so much um, dirt road and it holds the heat or what, but sometimes I can actually get home by coming through the dip. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah. and I would like to see it open. Okay. Um, a lot of people fish down there. I think you remember when it used to wash out frequently and it hasn't done that much yeah. anymore. So, whatever you did, just a little bit was left out, I think, and it would have stayed. Um, <coughs> the folks that built the house on either side of the dip, they invested a lot of money. Now you're going to tell them that they can't go in and out the way that they purchased the land, knowing that they could. So it was on that end, and, were, and it was being shut. I would be very upset. So thank you for listening. Sure. I'd like to see it open. Okay. Um, maybe we should uh, just uh, try a show of hands. Uh, how many people would like to see it uh, reopened? Raise your hand. We've got a lot of hands going on. Keep them up just one second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. I have this couple on iPad that you turned on your camera, but I don't know if you wish to raise your hand. Yeah. Do you want it to stay open? No, you don't. Okay, they're open. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how many do you have? 16, I believe. 15 or 16. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 16, I believe. 16, so it's a total of 25. 
Okay, and how many would like to see it closed? We've got one, two, three. So the, the couple there. We got your iPad. We got two here. Okay, so that's a total of five. So it looks oh, like. Oh, I'm sorry. Rebecca. Did we get my vote? Yeah. Okay, Tracy, Sit. where were you? I'm sorry. Tracy, were you on the. Does she want to open it? Oh, the iPad folks. You're what? I'm sorry? The iPad folks. Okay, she's in that one. So two, three, Cassandra Copley and Rebecca Chartrand, are you both in the nose? This seems very elementary, doesn't it? It seems, yeah, but uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're just doing uh, grassroots democracy here. Um, so, yeah, it seems as though the, the mood of the room is to keep it open. Uh, and maybe we do need to address uh, some traffic issues as we've been discussing uh, earlier tonight about pedestrian safety. Uh, I don't think you can paint white lines on a dirt road, but uh, I don't know other things. <laughs> you can! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, do we uh, need a vote from uh, the board? And, uh, I don't think you need a formal vote if you just. The will is to open the road. Public works can open the road. Okay. It's a uh, procedure to open a road. <laughs> 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 Fix what's broken. Unless I hear differently from other members of the board, I think that's the, the, the decision uh, to go forward with. Can I put you on the spot? What do you get a timeline for that? Well, I'll start making calls as I leave tonight. <laughs> to contractors, um, it's going to take a while because most contractors are you know, there's a lot of storm damage out there. Um, and since everybody wants it back open, I, I think we can get it Not done. Everyone. <laughs> Not everybody. Not everyone. <laughs> Not everyone, correct. Um, it'll be a little bit. Yeah. 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 But I'll make a call once I leave this meeting. Mm -hmm. For those that don't, it's going to be closed for a while. Yeah. <laughs> one, one last question. Sure, one. Yes, Paul. If this does happen again, do we, do we rethink our, our strategy? Yeah. I don't think that we have closed the door on this at all. Uh, it's just that uh, we have fill in place. Yep. The, the uh, culvert is still intact and, re and reusable, and uh, we think that we can get it done uh, relatively inexpensively. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank all right. you for all of that. We can now move forward to the next item. Mike's hollering at you there, Roger. Oh, Mike. Oh, yeah, Mike, sorry. <laughs> I have a question for Woody. Go ahead. As an alternative to just fixing what we have there, I know you've talked in the past possibly about looking at putting a bridge there uh, on that site. What are the cost ramifications of that alternative versus just fixing, you know, by the culvert? Well, I, I think if we fix what we have there, and the next step we can take is to do a hydraulic study to see what what the new science says should be there um, for a size of a structure. Um, that way, we have that information in our back pocket. Should it ever happen again, you know, um, we know that we need a 137 by 87 inch squash culvert. You know, let's let's do that little bit of engineering now, and maybe it comes in handy, and maybe we don't ever have to use it. Yep. Okay. Other questions for Woody while he's here? Thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to stick around for the next discussion, not up here, but I, I can clear a room pretty good. Excitement seems to be over. Um, <laughs> next on the agenda is the FEMA buyouts uh, for uh, Randall and Elm Street. Did any more info end up in our packet in regards to that? Yeah. Uh, Skip, you uh, asked uh, for yeah, some time it. to present some engineering. Please go yeah. forward. Got it. Um, thank you again, Nair. I had a good discussion with you folks uh, last meeting, and I feel like I was sort of focused on the mental reasons why I wanted to buy out and um, thinking about some of the things that you uh, mentioned, the neighborhoods and uh, 
housing and things, which I all, you know, kind of agree with the things. I uh, felt like I didn't focus on much on the fiscal reasons for wanting to consider the uh, the buyout and things. And I'm going to ask you a question, and Roger is not eligible to answer this because I've spilled the beans to him. Um, you've all driven or walked down Randall Street. What would be the elevation difference between one end to the other that you think there is there? A foot? I'm, I'm coming three. A foot? Mm. Which way? Uh, state reports. complex to Skip's house. A foot. Just a foot. I would bet quite a bit more than that. Yeah. That was my own cut. I, yeah. I would bet 14. 417 to 4. Well, here's, I asked Woody 20. what. Uh, <laughs> seven. I'm guessing 7. Have, so there's some information on the backside. And uh, <clears throat> when I drove out 3 o'clock in the morning here at the last flood, you know, I started out in two and a half feet of water and ended up no water on the other end of uh, Randall Street. Um, and Woody uh, gave me the uh, elevations of the manhole rims that are in the street. And Randall Street has a high point in front of the, what I call the Parson House, that's the second house from the end, not the one in the state, it's at 424. And on Elm Street, the Ayers Drive closest to the corner of uh, Randall Street is 420. So it's 3.8 feet from one end to the other. And I, unfortunately, live on the low end. So whereas, you know, I drove out of the water leaving and things. So, even though we're in the same neighborhood, we're all in the floodplain, the risk of flooding is much greater on my end. Um, I have, back in uh, 2013, I think, after Irene, we uh, had to get elevation certificates to consider. We were looking at raising and things. And my elevation certificate, my first floor, is at 425. And uh, that's on the other side. I made a copy of the uh, FEMA firm that they call it flood information uh, regulation uh, map. Um, so 425 runs right up uh, Elm Street, partly. So. My first floor is right at uh, 425 in terms of uh, risk of flooding. So even though we're in the same neighborhood, you know, I end is a bigger risk that, and I want to really want to consider all the options of staying. I really would like to stay. Selling is an option to, and you know, what the FEMA buyout really offers. Um, also, at the um, part of this helped explain some comments I heard at the meeting you folks had at the fire station here a couple weeks ago. Whereas in this last flooding, the water came in from the backyards instead of down Randall Street. And um, I on the end, so I didn't pay attention. The water was there when I got up <laughs> uh, the mornings and things. But it explains why the water didn't get high enough to come in the other end of Randall Street. It came in sort of from Thatcher Brook end and flowed over the backyards there. Um, another feature that got mentioned in the group that I was in, I don't know what the other group is, there's a large storm drain that when Main Street was reconstructed starts over by Pilgrim Park comes uh, across the railroad tracks up Foundry Street, down Main Street, down Elm Street. It ends up out in back of the Drake's house. It's a uh, five Randall Street. It's a four foot diameter storm drain. It, it's 
huge and I took a picture of it today, what as close as I could get. This is the four foot um, pipe you can see. The gate is normally closed, but I think the pressure of the water must have opened it in the last uh, thing. So that's the four foot pipe where the water from, from uh, Main Street discharges. Um, and when the river gets over the end of it, the water backs up that pipe and comes out the storm drains. It's what floods where Perkins Funeral Parlor is in the Methodist Church. It comes out of the drains. And the drain on Elm Street in front of the ears is when the water starts coming out of that drain is when we get ready and leave, if we're awake. So um, that's just, you know, adds to the reason why I'm ready to look at the, uh, you know, buy out what FEMA does and uh, just as one of the options to consider along with, you know, people are still looking at the elevation there, which is a different, um, different cost and things and, you know, what the buyout is. So, um, so that's just added reasons why I'm ready to, to look at it and things. And I think uh, there's a couple houses on uh, Randall Street now for sale. One's been sold and mm -hmm. things. So anyway, thank you for your time. And whatever you decide, we'll work with it. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Skip. Thank you, Skip. Um, in the intervening two weeks, I guess my thoughts have shifted a bit on this uh, when Skip first came forward. My first concern was really that uh, this would be the beginning of the end for uh, housing on uh, Randall and uh, Elm Street, um, and that uh, we, the town would lose uh, 37 houses, uh, uh, which we can't afford to do um, because we're already down on housing. Um, but uh, uh, I know that uh, one of those houses that's currently for sale on Randall Street uh, has had uh, at least uh, 10 people come take a look at it and they don't have a single offer yet um, because people are very concerned about floods uh, and uh, the human mind uh, is fallible. I think after a certain amount of time, people start to forget and maybe they're more willing to reinvest. But uh, I'm uh, now feeling a little bit more sympathetic uh, and uh, more inclined towards uh, allowing uh, this uh, buyout to, uh, to proceed forward. Uh, I don't uh, I also uh, had the opportunity to talk to the governor along with Tom last Wednesday uh, and uh, we talked to him exclusively about flood mitigation um, and uh, he said that uh, he was willing to move forward uh, with all due speed in finding some way of uh, working in the cornfield to uh, mitigate flooding. Uh, so I think we will be pursuing that. Uh, but I don't want to deny Skip and the others uh, the opportunity, the option, which will be down, down the road a bit, but this is a place to start. Yes? Did you guys get a timeline from the governor on that? No. Um, <coughs> the couple conversations I've had with um, staff um, I think it's reasonable that the state can apply to FEMA to have some of the silver move from the cornfield that impacts their office complex as much as it does Randall Elm and other places so that could in theory be a product of 75% reimbursed through FEMA um, so that's I think one of their first orders of business, but you know, I think what the governor said was that they lowered, they lowered areas along the river. They just didn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. But it's state-owned property, um, 
so I, I don't think there's, I mean, there's obviously a money issue, but I don't think there's a, any huge regulatory impediments in front of it. Doug Farnham, his uh, flood czar, uh, was there at the meeting and he asked uh, Mr. Farnham why it hadn't been done already. And he just said it was because of different uh, funding priorities uh, and uh, seemed to indicate that uh, this, this could become a uh, immediate priority. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a couple. Yeah, come um, up Lisa Meyer, um, sure. uh, next to Skip's house. Yeah, Alyssa, um, come on up for oh. please. Oh, I just have a quick question. Um, sure. Any more discussion on the bottleneck that's further down the river that is running along the, the Harvey property? <coughs> so, yeah. in, a, in a little bit, there's a, a conversation about the hazard mitigation grant, which is an array of things we're looking at for the future. And so I think that's a better time to talk about that. There was some conversation. So the answer is yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, if I may go again, um, I don't see any harm in okaying the process for Skip, but it just starts the clock for us to come up with other solutions in the interim, right. which I think we should be racking our brains trying to figure out, but it still gives him the safety net if we fail to figure it out in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we do also have a, a request from uh, Brian Kravitz as well on Randall Street, mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. From the previous meeting, he's yeah. not here tonight, but he never did paperwork. Right. Oh, he didn't do paperwork. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good to know. Yeah. All right, um, further discussion? Or do I have a motion? I move to allow Skip Flanders to proceed with the FEMA buyout on, are you at 21 Elm? 21 Elm. 21 Elm Street. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Mike? My, my question is, I still think that it needs to, I'm not really against this, but I still think there needs to be a conversation about the whole street being raised, you know, all the homes being raised to make them more flood resilient. That needs to be done in coordination with some work with the cornfield and, you know, just in general, that whole river corridor making it a more flood resilient. I think I am very concerned about the total buyout of all the homes on Randall and Elm. I think it really would drastically change the character of our community and that concerns me and plus just the economic viability of that you know you know I, I think it's worth going ahead with Skip's proposal by looking at some of these other things in, in the interim. I agree and um, Skip and I had a conversation uh, I think it was yesterday morning um, and he noted that uh, his property is really uh, where the outflow of the water would go. So that could actually figure into a potential solution uh, to this. And uh, Tom has mentioned that we've got Roy Schiff, uh, the hydrologist, working on this. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get him in soon to uh, go over what some of the modeling looks like and what some of these real opportunities are and how do we get the engineering done to get them to move forward. Yeah. That uh, inspired a question. Would the FEMA buyout, yes, at the end of the day, we knock it down, can't use the property. We can't develop the property. Does that mean we can't dig in and use it as a diversion? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that would be prohibited based on what I know. In Northfield, they did a whole series of buyouts and made it exclusively for like mitigating yeah. stormwater oh, okay. impact. Yeah. So okay. I think there is, yeah, if yeah. it's further things that are decreasing flood impact, oh. I think that would okay. be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, any other comments here? 
No, I just think none of us take this lightly in terms of what it means. We as the select board are in this weird in-between mediation spot um, between FEMA and I think right now while there is the cost match and I don't disagree with any of the points Skip said. Skip serves on the housing task force. He's like the person I've known longest in Waterbury. So um, I just think we want to give him the option. So that's why I'm supporting this. Yeah, Chris. Um, this hurricane that just came up the coast, way out, did some pretty drastic damage to areas in Connecticut and New York, dumping 10 inches or better. You know, we haven't seen that big a number yet. I'm curious to know when the studies done of the cornfield, the money, the money paid, you know, the expense to, to mitigate, remove all that material. Uh, how much of an impact is that effort going to have on Randall Street if we get a, not when, but if, yeah. you know, or not if, but when if we get a. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, you know, well, you have to go back to 1927 to uh, know the answer to that. <laughs> I would like to add a comment. Rick Boyle would like to say something. Yep. Rick? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Um, you know, I, I spoke to Skip briefly about his, his uh, looking into buyout. And uh, boy, it breaks my heart that Skip's the best damn neighbor you could ever have, really, <laughs> truly. And uh, but I point that, you know, it, this is hard to manage when you're constantly getting hit. And uh, it, I would have, unfortunately, due to, in my opinion, and I think I'm not other, but due to the failure of the state, in some ways the town, to mitigate flooding, now we're getting to the point where people are having to get their homes bought out. Um, the urgency needs to be elevated to the highest degree because we're next. And I know people love looking down Elm Street and say in our house, and they talk about the character of the neighborhood, but the flood buyouts are happening, and we're at the low end, right with Skip. So we're, it, the potential for us going through a buyout is very real as well. But we don't want to leave. We want to stay here. We want to thrive here. We want to add to the cultural fabric of the community. We want to keep the house. Um, so before further mediation uh, efforts, um, really strong ones, especially getting um, a floodplain properties. By the way, just a quick comment that Roger made about taking, taking uh, Skip's house off the, uh, off the street would help with foot. I don't see how it would. I mean, his basement filled up. That was actually a lot of catch of water that won't be now because it's going to be filled in and be grass. So just going to add. So it doesn't really help with flooding. I don't see that, but it certainly helps Skip and uh, his eight and him and Kathy are the greatest people. And I think uh, if that's what they got to do, I understand, and we support it. But just keep in mind that yes, a lot of neighbors here are thinking the same thing. That maybe it's time to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. That's it. Zero, zero, three, zero, two, six. I do need them to identify themselves. Uh, thanks, Rick. Um, and uh, three. Zero, zero, three, zero, two, six. That's how you're identified on the screen with yeah. your hand up. You got your hand up, and you got a number oh. recognizing you, uh, identifying you. If you can't respond, then we can't re can't write. I'm not sure if that's me or not. This is Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Oh. Hi, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Teresa, I don't know why I'm 003026, but... <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is Teresa kind of incognito. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to do much for your campaign. Teresa, put it online, but... Oh, no, um, no, no. <laughs> yep. All right, go ahead. Um, so, here, let me just... Um, there you are. There she is. Yeah. Okay, there. Okay, that's, that's better proof than it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So uh, I just wanted to let people know that I've also had conversation with Doug Farnham, the state recovery officer, um, that, uh, you know, essentially uh, it just is adding information to what Tom had shared and what, what you shared, Roger, and that they actually, uh, he said that, uh, you know, this is unfortunate, but that resilience uh, has not been on their top priority. Recovery has been on their top priority and that, that now they are shifting priorities. That recovery, yes, is still a priority, but that resilience uh, has moved right up to the top of the list and that the cornfield, they recognize that the cornfield is something that they can take action on and um, they, uh, said uh, that we should be seeing some change in terms of um, the removal of the silt that has accumulated there and that they are getting estimates. And so um, I just want to um, make sure people understand that I'll definitely be working to make sure that that stays at the top of the priority list as I'm sure the um, Tom and the rest of the town folks will be as well. Uh, I think that they recognize that um, there was a pretty big misstep on this and that they need to do something sooner rather than later. Great. Thanks for your input and uh, advocacy. All right. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Let's give you guys our approval to move forward. Yeah, I'm excited. Two of you need to sign at least. Three of them. Three of them. Unless there's anything else on bios, uh, we'll move forward with the new DAG uh, loan committee. Uh, Skip, you're up again. <laughs> Thank you on your passport, and I assure you that whatever happens, I will talk to you before making any choices. So if you come up with a better solution, <laughs> I'm happy to stay. Roger is a great neighbor. He and Dallas, I see him every morning here. So, but not, so. Um, you, Dad, um, <clears throat> I didn't look up when we... Uh, did the UDAG, it's for urban development block grant that we got, the village got for Ben and Jerry's to be constructed. It was $600,000 that the government granted them and then they paid it back to the village over time with interest and um, it's over, I don't know how many millions of dollars. It's uh, about 1.8 million. I mean, that we've, gone through over time. I mean, it, it, it's been a great fund and it was administered by the trustees and things. Um, the, uh, since we created e-funded things, we've, uh, RW has sort of a loan committee that reviews the loans and, you know, sets what they recommend for an interest and collateral and things. And, uh, they have a three-person committee, and Tom is, represents us as the chairman, and we had a person at large we were trying to recruit to make it a five-man committee, and we weren't successful. So we've discussed this over the last couple meetings at EFUD and things, and uh, thought it would be good to have a select board person added to the committee. Um, and we've voted to do that, that the select board would actually choose one of your members to serve on the committee. So um, whoever, if one of you is uh, willing to do that, the, the select board can, you know, just tell the manager who you choose. I think Tom has already advertised for a person at large that EFUD would uh, So, 
So I'm just here to let you know that we're waiting for you folks to, you know, select someone who's willing to serve on the committee, and you can just let uh, Tom know who it is. We haven't set any terms for, um, Life of time. you know, the person at large and the other. We might set the terms that it goes from town meeting day to town meeting day, depending on things. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, um, if you so choose, you can let us know. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm just wondering, Skip, what's a why at this point are you coming to uh, broaden the uh, participation? Of the, of the well, we just thought it. Um, you know, trying to broaden the committee, it, it really affects the town as well as EFUD that, you know, we haven't had any applicants uh, outside the vill old village limits or EFUD there, but there isn't any restrictions that we said that they could mm -hmm. have alone in the town, and we just thought, you might be interested in what happens and, you know, participate in it. The loans would all, um, they have a recommendation and it comes back to EFUD to, you know, authorize the final uh, mm -hmm. loan in terms and things. I think we've only had one or two since you. Well, let's see, we've had, um, most recently we had Maker's Fear. We had a So Street Cafe and we had Sunstro Pizza. Yeah, we've had those quite a few. Well, as it turns out, there is uh, a fair bit of interest. Uh, Mike indicated his interest to me you know, right before the board meeting, and uh, I myself am interested uh, because uh, I turned over my liaison <laughs> role to uh, the rec committee to Ian earlier this year, and uh, um, you know, all alone now, don't have anything to do. And, uh, so, <laughs> So there's that. So we, we may have to, Mike and I may have to arm wrestle to uh, figure out exactly who's going to get, get these on. Well, we'll, we'll have, have a us. seat waiting for whoever you pick to. Uh... Okay. And you don't have a particular timeline in mind when you need an answer from us? No. Okay. I'm going to make a motion to make you guys arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> Lefty. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, I think Mike is talking and Mike, we can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> did I do that? No. I did that. <laughs> Mike. Me. Go ahead. I have participated in a number of different loan committees and expect both commercial, residential, and a variety of roles. And with my financial background, I think I could really be a, a significant asset to EFUD on, on loan decisions. Um, you know, that's my background. I, I, know, I know I could do that. I've done that, chaired loan committees. Um, you know, it's just something that really, you know, when that came up, it really interests me. But, you know, me and Roger maybe have, could have that discussion, you know, offline. Yeah, you might have to turn uh, DRB over to me then. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. That plus the arm wrestle. No. Lefty. Okay. Uh, I guess Mike and I will we'll hash this one out amongst uh, ourselves so we don't have to make a decision tonight. Sounds great. I'm sure me and Roger could work this out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Start lifting. Um, <laughs> Next on the agenda is Text My Dove. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have a... Sure, so the... I can share the screen if that's okay. Yeah, you should be able to. So the town... Um, after the flooding, I went through a process. There was some desire to purchase some software to allow us better communicate with folks. Um, during floods in general. Um, so went through a process, reviewed a bunch of vendors. In the end, I created a small review committee which consisted of uh, myself and some folks that were pretty deeply involved in the flood response last year. Um, 
and we went through a demo of TextMyGov, and TextMyGov is a really simple platform. That's one of the beautiful things of it, but it's a simple way for people just by texting to report issues to the town. It doesn't have to be a flood. It can be anything simple. So if you go to the town website, I'm gonna, gonna have to move this. But on our website, there's a simple little widget with the phone number, so anyone can text that number and simply text hi, and you are in the system. And so that the simplest, um, you know, the simplest way to use the platform is if you're driving down the road and there's a big pothole, you can text pothole. There's a series of keywords that that we can create, and so we've got general categories for things like flooding, but also roads and and recreation fields, and so we can create this array of categories and keywords where it recognizes what you're texting. And if it doesn't, um, on the back end, we can see all the information. So we can say, well, people are texting about an issue it's not in our system. Let's go ahead and put it into our system. So it's real easy, real user-friendly. It's really easy to, man to manipulate behind the scenes to, um, to do that. So if, for example, you're driving down the road and there's Let's use an example of a low-hanging tree limb that's, that's kind of in your way. You can text, and, you, and you'll be prompted, and you'll actually be, asked to, you'll actually be asked to send a picture and give, your, give the nearest street address if you have it. So a simple way for us to get information about things going on in the community that we might not always have eyes on. Um, and then in terms of something specific like a natural disaster, um, one, for our internal purposes, we can create texting groups um, using this system. So if crew mm -hmm. wants to use it and, and they've got an account set up already, they might not quite know that yet, they can use this for their internal communication. But we, could, we can also to create text groups within neighborhoods. So again, an, an easy way to communicate information to people, uh, essentially, a platform that's simple, user-friendly, that we can change and we can get information to the community. The other thing we can do is we can draw a line around neighborhoods. And anyone with a cell phone in real time in that area can get a text from the, from the town. Mm -hmm. So, if, so if, if I was one of, on one of those groups, would I get the text, every text that came into that group? Yeah, if we created a group for whatever purpose, mm -hmm. you would get that text. You don't have to join the groups. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted a tool that, that fit with budget, um, that was really easy and flexible. And one of the challenges is there's a lot of platforms out there to choose from, um, but some of them are, are not as user-friendly in the sense that you've got to call this off our company and, and go back and forth to, to change the platform. This one is dirt simple, which is, I think, one of the major appeals of it. Um, and so we'll, we'll take it from there. What I haven't really done is a big public presentation. We thought about doing this a little, little while back, and it just got delayed, so I'm gonna start that real soon, and they actually have marketing information to help get the word out, get the phone number out. Um, so I think it's the right tool, um, and if it's not, we're not wedded to it in perpetuity, you can always, you can always end, the, end the agreement. Um, and it's about um, it's about five grand a year, a little bit a little bit of a setup fee, but about five grand a year, which seemed reasonably affordable. And it's already up and running. It's already up and running, and, and we can tweak it as we see fit. So I'm hoping people start reporting because once they report, we're going to have more information and know we're correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a question for um, people who are concerned that this organization already has their phone number. You need to text hi to this phone number to go onto their lists, correct? Yeah. So if you I don't just did it, it was really easy. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa. We didn't tell her to say that. No, I think it's just <laughs> acknowledging BT Alert exists and is really important. And we've yeah. tried to a learning between 2023 and 2024 is how to get some of those most important critical community countywide updates on staff. But I think just in now having done this three times, it's acknowledging that there is a need for sometimes 
more localized communication. Again, the town Facebook is all part of this, but just in my perspective, this is one other piece, one other tool in the toolbox, but particularly the ability to geolocate and serve particular regions that we know might be particularly impacted um, is really useful. So um, thanks to Tom and all for helping to set it up. And again, I think we'll evolve how and what we're using it for, but that was why it felt important to have an additional local tool to help share info. One of the just to elaborate on that a little bit, one of the challenges with Vermont Alert is not a challenge, but it's a feature of the program is that not not everyone can necessarily report to Vermont Alert and get it out there immediately. I've got the ability to do that, but Woodruff can do that. Um, this allows John Q. Public to report to us something that we could put out to Vermont Alert. Um, one challenge with Facebook is if you have a town Facebook account. It also has to be associated with a personal account. Mm -hmm. So you don't want necessarily, you know, people might not necessarily want to administer the town Facebook page uh, from that perspective. But um, this has none of that. We simply, you simply log in with a, with a, pass, with a username and a password that we can get you started with. So um, it's easier in the sense that um, if, if we need to report something to the public using this tool, it's on your cell phone, super easy, and we can we can have um, town employees, we can have select board members as part of the chain, we can have crew as part of the chain, we can have the natural disaster sponsor committee. That's that's all up to us to decide who gets access to this and to report, but it's not limited. So the more sometimes the more hands the better. And would there be any connection with um, uh, the Vermont tip line that uh, Lieutenant uh, Howard was just mentioning? We don't have, as yet, public safety as a category in the system, but, mm -hmm. but we can add that um, in minutes. So if there's a desire to do that, to have uh, you know, speeding, for instance, something like that, we can, we can put that in there. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of feedback I'm looking for. The question is, what do we want to incorporate into the system? Other comments? Yes, Karen. What do I get if I write vote? That, uh, that's not one yet, but let's add that. No, it's on there. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, okay, maybe I tried. I, I didn't add that one personally. That may have been a stock one. But. I'm like, what? So it was right. Oh, man. Um, so let's do that. Let's add that to it. It doesn't even say what you're voting for. Well, I guess my question, Tom, is, and we can talk about this out of the public session, but if somebody goes on this platform and writes mm -hmm. vote, mm -hmm. I don't know. Is this a list of questions? Is this like that Comcast hellhole I was stuck in for days where I just get all these? Are we, pre <laughs> are we digging another hellhole here, Tom? Uh, so you, <laughs> could, you could type in vote, and we can pre program it, and it can just yeah. say, the election is this day at this okay. location, and okay. it, it so sort of ends there. Okay, okay. But but you're not going to get... At some point, it's going to have to say, contact the town clerk, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, then, then I'm fine Yeah, with so it. we can... There's, I believe, I believe there's... I forget if it's three or four of them, but there's three or four... Prompts of sorts. Prompts until... Yeah. Until there's a final one. Gotcha. Okay. So but the word taxes is going to say contact the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we can put in keywords. You know, you take a few minutes. There's vote. There's absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. um, there's right. there's a few others perhaps. So yeah. we can we can put those keywords in and and yeah. develop the prompts real easy. So that's a great one to add. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, we'll see. Again, I mean, I already have a platform to manage, right? So. Yep. Um, we can talk about it, whether that's a good one for us mm -hmm. to have on there or if it should be omitted. I'd like to know more about how it sure. works, but mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Yes, Lisa. So Go on board. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, okay, it, it, it might be helpful for people to hear this, I suppose. Um, Lisa, so love you. I don't want to come around that. Um, you're talking about really some specific communications in like subsets. I'm thinking overall mm -hmm. um, in terms of outgoing communication, like during the flood, when it was happening. Um, I know as somebody who was managing a Facebook page during some of that, I was getting lots of questions um, from people in town, people who um, have to go through our town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that needed to come home off the highway and get to Duxbury or Wheatsfield or Moortown or whatever. 
Um, will there be messages that go out, like blanket everybody who's in the system, Main Street at the roundabout in North Main is closed, use Stowe Street kind of thing. Like, will that be a way to put that kind of information out in real time to people um, so that they know? Because sometimes we're not reporting to VT Alert to know if those roads are open and they're not on that 511 map. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, a, it's a good question and the answer is I'm not entirely sure yet. I, 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 the challenge you have is um, you want your own local tool and you want to, and there's always some overlap with other tools, but you don't want to um, necessarily reinvent the wheel. So I feel like Vermont Alert is reasonably well established, and mm -hmm. Vermont Alert, my judgment, is perfect for road conditions. Mm -hmm. That's 99% of what it's used for, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's all the alerts I get, really. So I feel like, you know, that platform is really good for things like, you know, Route 2 is now impassable. But we didn't have messages coming out of Waterbury on VT Alert in the last two floods or three floods, however many there have been there. Three floods, Next I guess. Time for sure. <laughs> um, I posted a few. No yeah, time. but there were there were times where like Main Street was closed or it was closed down by the on the other end of town down by um, Snoko Station and you couldn't get through. Um, Do my reports. Yeah, and um, anyway, I'm just wondering, I'm sure people, because there may be people who aren't just Waterbury residents, but maybe there's Duxbury residents that drive through here all the time or, or will be interested or have family here that would want to be signed up for this so they could be able to get the mm -hmm. information to them as a, it being a two-way communication and not just people reporting things to the town. Like being upfront, this was more public communication than we've had before. I think we're iterating in real time and candidly haven't fully figured it out, as you saw live time here around right. prompts and things. So I think I really appreciate you raising it. It's great points for us to consider, and I think we'll plan to have this on our next and subsequent agendas as we get more dialed in on exactly who it should be serving and in what ways. But for now, we just wanted to at least have some acknowledgement of this thing floating it's, around on the town homepage as we kick it off. We'll get that information out there. I think we'll, we'll try to get that out to see more people <laughs> hopping on and, and signing up for it. And um, you can start to you know, see how the back and forth is going to work. So um, I just want to make sure I can help explain it. Yeah. So thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks, Lisa. Any other questions, comments about Text My Gov? I would just like to make a comment that I think in our current age of technology, this is a great tool to have on hand in emergencies or in general. You know, with the pothole situation, if you see somebody's house on fire, and you, for some, and you for some reason don't call 911. Uh, right, or, or something, you see a beaver dam under a bridge, right? Like, so it's a, it's a perfect tool to immediately alert the town to something they may, may or may not know about yet. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you. May I ask a quick question? Please do. Um, in the interest of knowing that Keith Kuban has been online now for quite a while, is there any chance we can switch the next two agenda items? Uh, to the, uh, oh yeah, you want to adopt the, uh, have the adoption of the local hazard mitigation plan first? Well, I just know that that's what he's here for. Yeah, and he has been very patient. It is now uh, a little past nine. Um, anyone have any problems with uh, juggling a, uh, an agenda item? Do we need a motion to juggle an agenda item? Um, sure, go ahead. I move to move. <laughs> I move to move adopt local mitigation hazard mitigation plan um, to the agenda item before hazard grant application. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Any against? Oh, Mike is uh, muted. No, no, I saw a hand. Oh, OK. Uh, and uh, any abstentions? All right. That passes. And now we can move on to adopt the uh, local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, is Keith ready to uh, tell us what we're uh, ready to adopt? OK. Uh, what uh, we're proposing here is what's called a preliminary adoption. So this would be, you know, uh, we've had the draft up for public comment on the town website uh, for the last two weeks. 
actually a little over two weeks. Uh, as the plan stands with uh, any comments that have been received, uh, we uh, are basically requesting that it be adopted as stands. Uh, we, we, I was hoping to have the maps done today. Our, uh, uh, our GIS mapper didn't quite hit the deadline for tonight, uh, that I'd be able to share those with you. Uh, they should be done by about noon tomorrow. We'll attach those on the back. Those go right at the end of the plan. Mm -hmm. And there's one small piece of text. It's just the number of structures within the river corridor that as he's completing this, he'll run an analysis on that. Outside of that, everything else in the plan is basically as stands, uh, as you've been able to see it. Uh, so the, uh, the spot on text, if you wanted to look at it, is on page 12. It was a highlighted area. Uh, just to put in the uh, total number and actually we can put in a dollar value for that as well. Uh, and then on page 39 is the uh, actual preliminary adoption sheet. And as the, the way these work with this preliminary adoption, it basically is you uh, accepting the plan at this point. You know, uh, like I said, we'll put those maps on the, on the back page. We'll then submit this to BEM. BEM will do their review. They'll kick it back to uh, us, which uh, Neil at the town will also be uh, CC'd on any emails with that. We will make any edits that they require. You know, if for some reason they think we, we you know, they just need a little more data or uh, something for one of the uh, sections to meet the uh, new FEMA requirements, we'll be able to address those uh, in coordination with uh, the town. We'll then resubmit that. That will then go into FEMA at that point. FEMA will then do the final review. Uh, and then, you know, that will lead to the overall acceptance. Uh, but as soon as we submit this, it'll uh, grant you that interim status for the LHMP, which, you know, we're, we're trying to get this through so because we know the town's interested in getting those hazard mitigation grants, so we definitely want to get this basically finished through the entire edit process as fast as possible so that you can totally proceed with those grants and don't get to that end point and have to wait for this to finish edits before you can access that hazard mitigation money. And, that, and that's about it. You, know, you have any questions? Um, Keith, how um, often does the plan need to be updated and readopted? In every five years. Now it's a living plan, so if there's anything in it, you know, technically uh, every year it should have maintenance. Just one, at least one meeting of just kind of looking through, seeing where you're at on any mitigation actions, kind of giving a little update. But you can also add at any point in time any new projects that come up if you're interested in pursuing uh, FEMA funding because it, that helps with the scoring for any of their funding is if it's listed on almost any grant FEMA has they'll ask that you know in the application is it listed on your hazard mitigation plan so if at any point in time the town decides hey I want to add something else to that it just takes a select board vote okay other questions for Keith Do I have a motion? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Joe Hayes over at Huntington Place. I can't. Sorry, I can't get my hand to raise here, so I apologize That's for just right. jumping in. But could, could I have a minute or so? Please do. Yeah. So, um, and I apologize. I haven't uh, up and I just looked at the plan uh, earlier this evening, and it's very comprehensive. Um, and I know there's a lot of discussions on Randall Street and Elm Street, but I don't want to forget Armory Drive, uh, O'Hare Court, and Union Street. Um, the severe flooding that this area has um, had in the last year and more, I just want to make sure, I, I, as I looked at Table 6 and 7, I did see general statements made about ele uh, elevating and upsizing bridges to increase the pre the debris passage, um, pursue projects to lower flooding at the mouth of Thatcher Brook. And I apologize. I think it's still called Thatcher Brook, right? I mean, I don't know. If we yeah, the uh, school changed its name, but not the brook. Also, <laughs> the cleaning of debris uh, from support under brackets underneath low-lying bridges. So I, 
I guess what I'm saying is I just want to make sure I don't see details in this plan. I see general statements, and maybe that's what this plan is for, just general statements on flood mitigation plans. Is that correct, or should it have more specific uh, statements? So I can, yeah, I, I can definitely speak to that. Uh, these plans can, you know, uh, they can do both. You, you kind of want to have that general statement in case you missed something on some of the things, but uh, uh, on some of them, like, you know, because uh, we called out some specific culverts that, uh, that from looking at studies need upsize. One of the things we found while looking through Waterbury is there hadn't been that many uh, actual stream studies to truly understand which pieces need upsize. Uh, actually, while working on this, uh, uh, we uh, here at CDRPC had put together a uh, brick application trying to get uh, some FEMA funding for that. FEMA this year did something different. Previously in the past, you could apply for a brick grant, so a building resilient, of resilient infrastructures and communities grant. Uh, we had uh, tried applying for one of those, and usually they would hold that. Even if, you, if as long as you're working on on your LHMP, they would basically accept the application, just hang on to it, and as soon as you got it in, they would then queue up that funding for you. Uh, this year, they totally changed the rules on that, and uh, if you didn't have an LHMP already completed, they just threw out that grant application. So it it, it delayed the uh, process a little bit because I, I stopped working on this to get that uh, that grant application together, the which, like I said, in uh, in the past, they've all right, always handled it differently. Uh, this year they totally, you know, ch changed the process on us, and uh, there was actually multiple towns in the region that kind of got caught up in that. Uh, I see. I, I see. Okay. Well, yeah, and just like you said, there were mentions of specific culverts. So that's when I got a little nervous that the plan didn't have specifics about you know, the Armory Bridge, the bridge that goes underneath North Main Street, uh, you know, the flooding in this area. So I'm just, I just want to make sure that the plan will address this area. That's what I didn't see, but I saw other mentions of other areas of Waterbury, but not this area. So that, I, I assume it'll, it'll address this area. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, if the uh, if the select board is so interested, we can add add text in on that, even with the adoption, and I can still go back in and change that. But that would uh, you know, that that require the select board to notify. Yeah. And, and I don't want to delay the process. I just want to make sure that this area over here that's been flooded multiple times is included in the plan. Yeah, Joe, I think uh, we can, uh, Select Board uh, does intend to address uh, that area. Uh, clearly, uh, is an area of concern we've already approved uh, for buyouts at the uh, bottom of uh, Union Street. And uh, I know that uh, Tom has directed Roy Schiff uh, to include that in his modeling. Um, so uh, our focus has not been taken away from that at all. Um, I guess the question is, uh, would that further delay the plan? I am sort of concerned that the uh, rules have changed and that, in fact, we did miss uh, an opportunity to get uh, this funding approved earlier this year because of this study remained uh, unapproved when we could have possibly gotten it done sooner. Roger. Um, yeah. I, okay, I, yeah, I don't want to delay it. I just, so, so, so I'll take your folks' word at this that it will include this this area here where where um, I was just talking about. I believe it, it mentions yeah. Graves Gravesbrook, which is, I believe, Gravesbrook feeds into Thatcherbrook. <laughs> yeah. So it is considering how so you know that passes through mm -hmm. Union Street and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I have no doubt if there's a viable hazard mitigation project in those areas, um, this this. Plan is sufficiently broad that, that FEMA is not going to say no because it wasn't sufficiently covered in our plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Philomena. I just want to uh, tack on to what Joe Hayes says. My name is Philomena 
sign our name of the Huntington Place also on the board there. Um, there's 28 condos, 11 of those newer cottages, and a handful of homes there. Um, and we're trapped for a couple of days, but there's no way out. So um, just want to really put my two cents worth in and say, we need that to also be a priority. Yeah, and, and I think you have uh, our assurance that it will be a priority. Um, uh, the next opportunity, we'll add in more specific language. Uh, I just uh, am a little bit cautious about further delaying yeah. the signing of this uh, grant because we missed a, a cycle already because of these delays. But if we don't add us in... No, no, no. As Tom just mentioned, because of the broad scope of the, the general nature of this study, Anything that we prioritize will be accepted by FEMA because it's it's mentioned in here that it, that, that also is a concern. It's just we don't have a specific bridge mentioned uh, like the Armory Drive bridge. And we can. I just don't want to take another month to do so. Yes. Um, I was going to move that to adopt the resolution adopting the Waterbury Vermont 2024 local hazard mitigation plan using the text in the certificate of adoption. And I'm just going to read the last paragraph that says in accordance with Vermont statute, um, the Waterbury Select Board adopts the 2024 local hazard mitigation plan. While content related to the town of Waterbury may require revisions to meet the plan approval requirements, changes occurring after the adoption will not require the town of Waterbury to readopt any Further iterations of the plan, subsequent plan updates following the approval period will require separate um, adoption resolutions. Just saying we can update it sooner than we need to for this federal grant. So I want to just make that motion again, like everyone said, um, so we can move this forward, but also just acknowledge again for the room and everyone here today, that is our intent to update it sooner and with more specificity. But for now, just making sure it's on the books is most important. Okay. Did you just make a motion? I said it. <laughs> <laughs> this is classic. I did, I did just reference the page so Karen didn't have to type it. And then I was reading out loud. This one, this page one. Page 39. Obviously. As in the thing. And then I just read the last paragraph out loud. All right. Thank you. Do I have a second? Uh, Mike seconded. Oh, beautiful. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 New post. And the, uh, Abstentions. Uh, abstentions. There we go. Thank you. And then we need a signature. Don't hear any? Okay. The motion passes. And I can sign right. on behalf of the board. Are you ready to notarize? Yeah. I think it's just a witness, but you go ahead. Okay. Just a Thank you, Keith. And to your colleagues. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's a living document, so at any point in time, if you want to add anything yeah. to it, just what, you know, are you there? Are you just takes a select board vote. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Keith. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next up is uh, the grant hazard mitigation grant application. It's a lot of grants. <laughs> now no, that we have the plan, right. now we, have we the got grants. a plan, we can move forward, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, what do we have on this one? I can just give an overview of uh, what we've been working on uh, behind the scenes. So we did hire. I mentioned this at the flood specific meeting at the fire station. We did hire SLR consulting to do a, a broader uh, a broader study of the river, and that study goes from the ice center lands uh, all the way down um, Route 2 to essentially Jenny Davis Road area. It also goes up Thatcher Brook to Neyland Flats and up Grays Brook um, to Perry Hill Road area, where we had some flooding and culvert fail. Just this past year. Um, much of the data will not be obtained in full until the leaves are off the trees because it's, it's wider data, which is collected via satellite. So having the leaves off the trees gives record information. Um, they also have existing data from prior floods that they use to incorporate to the model. So they, um, they did a similar, slightly more limited study post Irene, but they did not have LIDAR data. And they not have two-dimensional modeling, which I do now, so they, they think that will give some greater specificity. 
um, even to the to the work that was done. Um, so the um, once that work is done as part of the hazard mitigation pre-applications, there's a, essentially a cost-benefit analysis done to at least from 30,000 feet ballpark what the model is telling us will produce some flood mitigation results versus the cost, and, and that's information the state and federal government use to determine what to fund. Um, but what, what they're really looking at specifically is a few things. Um, there was the flood inundation study a decade ago, which really identified the, the pinch point um, across the river that's, that's privately owned. Um, that will be looked at again, uh, but they're also interested in looking at um, some of the um, some of the channel, uh, some of the changes in the river channel, and some of the some of the fill. And that um, you know the state has been pretty clear in saying that dredging is not really an option; um, doesn't serve for a long-term benefit. Very expensive, but some selective um, some selective work to get rid of bars and rivers and things like that that have a very specific constriction point is, is possible and has happened before. And that's something that they're looking at essentially in the area that we're looking at right here. It's part of it. Um, the cornfield that's been talked about is another big part of it. And, and the, the initial feeling there is even before the modeling is that it, uh, Gordon Miller had that great shot with the drone where the center of the cornfield is higher. And that the, the cornfield can certainly be swelled differently to create some positive drainage. Um, to elaborate there a little bit further, too, I have suggested to the state of Vermont that um, the town should either own the cornfield or have a long term maintenance agreement. So when the cornfield soaks in in the future, we have some automatic right without requiring the approval of the legislature or even the Department of Building and General Services to simply go in and, and deal with that problem more urgent for us, I think, than, than for them. And maybe ownership of the cornfield is a better option long term. Um, there's also some, some interest um, in looking at um, a little bit more floodplain reconnection here in Dak Row. That's a, that's a challenge because the playing fields are also an asset, um, but these are the, the these are the different things you may have to weigh in the future depending on what the study tells us. And there's also some conversation um, about looking at the Winooski Street Bridge. The, the study a decade ago did not point to the bridge as a restriction, but, but better data into the study may, may show us something different. Um, there's also some consideration for the area, the low-lying lands that typically washes out anyway, um, to essentially invite the river channel there and perhaps even make it more low-lying um, and would that perhaps reduce the restriction. Um, sewer treatment plant was, was, was also discussed at the fire station. Uh, the, the big concern there is um, the fields do overtop with flooding. Um, that's happened the last three floods. Um, so there is some, some effort to look at that and perhaps lower the field. Um, what appears to be necessary beyond that is to armor the lagoons. Um, they have some. They have some riprap now. They have a little bit of heavy stone. Something. Something. The engineer who talks to me says to me says they've also got decades of biosolid accumulation, which is its own armor in a way. Um, but the concern is if the if the lagoons are overtopped and there's current, then you lose the lagoons. So some some better armoring of the lagoons is something they're um, they're looking into. Um, have they ever been overtopped? Well, uh, they were overtopped during their rain. We had a little bit of clearance um, last July. Um, the other piece is, um, you know, the wastewater plant typical day is, is 200, 250,000 gallons of, of, of influent. Um, it was over a million a day during the flooding, and that's, um, that's essentially just groundwater infiltration coming into the system, but it's got to be dealt with. And so the way to deal with it is that they, they put siphon hoses and pumps directly into the lagoons and that just goes straight out into the river. Um, <coughs> we've been fortunate in that twice Stowe lent us their trash pump, which is a big 
I don't know the horsepower, but a big diesel-driven six-inch trash pump, which is, you know, 100,000 gallons an hour size trash pump. Um, so we've been fortunate to use that. We've got a bunch of siphon hoses ready to go. Um, but the thought is perhaps we shouldn't rely on the kindness of Stowe, and they might need their pump when we also need it. <laughs> um, the other thought is should we consider um, you know, some sort of some sort of a sliding gate, so we can we can open up a relief valve for the lagoons manually. Um, there's some conversation the state might not love that because if there's a mechanical device that can be opened, if it were to be opened during regular operations, that would be a illegal discharge. Um, so there need to be some fail safes there. It seems to me that we could probably overcome that. Um, Going a little further, the ice center land um, was looked at a decade ago, but um, the model really did not include moving the road, which has always been a possibility. And so we're going to take another look at that, consider moving the road. Um, as part of the park study uh, of a year and a half ago, right. um, that was also looked at. Um, but they decided to keep it in place. <laughs> They decided to keep it in place, but um, at that point there hadn't been a flood since Irene, and, and, and our thinking has changed a little bit, I think. Um, Route 2 is another, is another issue. There's essentially one culvert pipe that, that the water flows south and collects off the interstate and off the hillside, flows south, so the, the homes nearest to the interstate, their backyards flood first, so we're again looking to see if there's some some better, better drainage options there. That's that's likely difficult. If there's a need for additional culverts, you're talking about boring under a state highway and then somehow draining onto private property. If there's a need to upside the existing culvert, that's a bit of an easier proposition, and that would seem to be something we can accomplish um, in the short term. Um, the other piece is that as the flood study extends upstream to um, Thatcher and Grays Brooks, uh, all the bridges will be looked at as part of this. Um, and some additional floodplain reconnection options, of which we're, we're hoping there's going to be some identified. There is um, quite a bit of low-lying land already. Um, it's something we've we've noted, and I can I can share the screen again real quick. What is interesting is, so this is the town's online parcel maps. I'm trying to move the, the zoom window, but this is, this is the bottom of Union Street near the roundabout, and this highlighted area is land owned by the Edward Farrer Utility District. Um, now there, there is some EFUD infrastructure there, and some of this land is already low lying but the thought is between this land and perhaps an assemblage of bio parcels nearby in Union Street, there may be some, some option to lower the land further and create a little, little bit of storage there. Um, that whole yellow isn't EFUD, is it, Tom? That yellow is EFUD. Oh, okay. That's like the street. Not the street, but the... Everything but the street, essentially. All the way to the armory. Yeah, okay. yeah. There was some up by the armory. There was some fill for Main Street, oh, yeah. and and that was all put there. And I think the state owned it before then. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're trying to turn over every leaf we can, everything at our disposal. And if it's land owned by the town or EFUD, it's simply easier to accomplish something than than if it's privately owned. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> The other piece that they're going to take a close look at is the storm sewer system. Um, that's um, they're going to map the system as a first order of business, and then beyond that, um, they're going to see if there's any creative way to, to limit the damage a storm sewers cause when gravity fed storm sewers don't work in our favor. Um, mm -hmm. That that may include pumping. The, the question is. Where do you pump it to, and through what, uh, through what, what other line? Um, mm -hmm. That's not an easy thing or cheap thing to accomplish. Um, but essentially, creating a force main is what they do in some other communities that, that have routine floods, and so we'd like to study that here. 
Um, you know, I could easily see that being a, a seven-figure project if it were to come to fruition, um, but, it, but it could be a valid one, too. A um, couple other minor things that, that we'd like to look into, but they may not be part of the grant, or certainly will be part of the grant, but it may be that um, it's easier to accomplish them without dealing with the challenges of a federal grant and, and the utilities behind town hall are a simple one if, if it's just a matter of, you know, those utilities were built to be exactly two feet above the floodplain if we can simply, and they're on platforms already, if we can raise those three or four feet and give ourselves some protection, we're just going to get quotes probably and figure out a way to budget and do that. Um, it may not be worth the hassle of going through a federal grant process. Are the maps that uh, Keith referenced uh, going to have uh, a new floodplain? So the new floodplain maps, um, I am told, will be out next summer. The, the work being done by SLR can help because when the floodplain maps come out, they will be draft maps. And the state has indicated to me and others that those maps can be revised before they are finalized, but we've got to have local knowledge some proof of past flooding and where the lines were, but also a study like this. So there could be some ability to look at those maps and, and perhaps um, make some adjustments on the margins based on what the study mm -hmm. is telling us. Cool. Can I ask a, may I ask a question? Please. Um, what does the field behind, you know where the kids go skiing down there in that private property, the Moran property, by the Metro Grove or Grace mm -hmm. no. What does that look like when it floods? I know that's a stupid question, I should know the answer, but does that whole field it flood? It looks wet. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I, we always talk about the Harvey property or right. the cornfield. I haven't heard anybody talk about that Moran field, whether that would help with the <coughs> mitigation of for these folks on mm -hmm. Huntington, for yeah. example. So I think that's why we're going further up the Bryce gotcha. than the last time to try to identify any storage opportunities we can. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, other piece I just failed to mention is the study is really, it's done in conjunction with the, uh, the dams as part of this, that's all part of the modeling. And, you know, I've, I've been in contact with the dam safety engineers over the past year, I've, I've got quite frankly, a lot of confidence in, in their procedures. But I want to be sure that was a good study because there is a sentiment I've heard from some people that the dams are operated more for recreation than perhaps they should be at times. Um, you know, we certainly haven't had a dam over top. We, we certainly haven't, haven't had the floodgates over top in, in, in recent years, at least that I'm aware of. But that is a concern, so putting that to the study, I thought was a valid thing to, to address. So that's the, the summary of um, you know where we're at. So the hazard mitigation pre-app can go in soon, and then I think we'll have pretty good data around the end of the year. And when would the pre-app location go in? Uh, be, by the end of the month. End of this month. Yeah. Okay. And then it's anticipated that's going to be way oversubscribed in the state, right? So is it going to be a back and forth with them about what makes the cut? <coughs> Be a back and forth with them. I would be quite frankly surprised if the cornfield mm -hmm. didn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd also suggest, you know, I, I believe the number they threw out was 100 million was what they have to, to work with, and that can go pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, if we've got good projects, um, this is this is just a, a one year cycle. So yeah we can keep plugging away and we don't have to be reliant on the state necessarily. Uh, there's other funding sources aside from hazard mitigation, um, including local funding if it's a that big priority to the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So understanding this is really like a big laundry list of all the potential projects. We'll know more after this pre-application phase about what, if any, the state moves forward, we hope at least some of it, and then that will give us better info for our own work or applying to other grants, yeah. Yeah. you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. And Teresa indicated that uh, the silt uh, removal would be something the state could uh, move on without any further grant funding? 
I would think they could. I mean, it, 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 it's analogous. It, it, the analogy I draw is to any town infrastructure that's damaged from the flood, whether it's a, you know, a, a town park. I mean, I mean, for gosh sakes, we've got 125 grand in eligible FEMA money for the soccer field that was damaged mm -hmm. because sill was deposited in the soccer field, and we applied for that as a FEMA project. We haven't spent the money yet, but it's available to us. I, I simply cannot imagine this, the, the federal government agreeing that the soccer field is a big enough priority to spend that sort of money on it and rejecting the silt buildup in the cornfield, which certainly affects a lot of people and affects the state office complex. So it seems like it's a, it's a no-brainer for the state to apply for that. Not as a hazard mitigation project even, but just as a damage right. for the storm. So the hazard mitigation perhaps could pay for the 25% that wouldn't otherwise be covered. So I'm really hopeful that at a minimum that can be taken care of pretty quick. All right. Other questions for Tom uh, on the grant hazard mitigation grant application? There's a lot of information. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, that was a waterfall, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Billy, is end up? Uh, yeah. Uh, for the record, Billy Victor. Hey, um, there were uh, when we did the when you did the select board meeting and we had all of those everybody together. There were they, we prioritized the big issues, but there were a lot of really small projects. So does the consultant have access to the, the yeah. entire list that we keep? Good. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing on the cornfield, one of the one of the interesting suggestions that came out of our group was. Um, you could not only dig out the cornfield and lower it, but you could plant it. Yeah. And so that you could make it something that would actually, because of the plant and the vegetation, it would even hold more water. And people were talking about already making a park. But friends with Michelle Braun said, the friends with Anuski probably could get a grant that you could plant the cornfield. So rather than having corn there and then digging a hole and not knowing what to do with it, we could actually make something that would be much more resilient than, a, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be pejorative, but I don't know what happens when you dig when you dig down, it sounds like we're just making a big swimming pool. But if we plant it, I think we may have some really good space that will be more resilient and actually have some aesthetically pleasing aspects of the town. Yeah. So just a reminder that's out there. Yeah, no, I think the hydrologist will first let us know how far we need to, you know, what's the bang for the buck for lowering the cornfield and how many yards of fill need to come out to, right. to accomplish that. But I think, I think that's all part of one project in the end. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, do you need any action from the select board on this? Um, I I do not believe I need a I need a formal action. Um, I can submit the grant application, and if the state tells me I, I need formal action, I'll make sure to convene a special meeting before the end of the month. All right. Don't have that much time left. But thus far, the 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 same process is, is by which you submit, um, for instance, buyouts, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's, I can submit those online and essentially you're in the pipeline before the paperwork is even completed. Okay. <clears throat> but if you want um, to simply get it over with, I suppose that wouldn't hurt. Do I have a motion? Um, I'll move to authorize the municipal manager to submit a, a hazard mitigation grant application on behalf of the town of Waterbury and also to make sure that what is submitted in that grant is posted publicly so everyone can see it. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We have our full authorization to submit. Um, next item on the agenda is housing trust fund and local option tax funding options. Can you have a proposal? I did have a proposal. Um, it's not in our packets, therefore the audience cannot see it. 
proposal broke down local option tax spending into three categories, broken into thirds, first third, uh, housing initiatives, second third, roads and infrastructure, and the third third was paying down debt, which we do have in our packet somewhere. Um, that was the proposal, that's the whole thing. Okay. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the three? A little slower. Housing. The first third was housing initiatives, the second third was roads and infrastructure, and the third third was paying down Waterbury's debts. Something for everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so Alyssa. I was just going to say a couple things in terms of framing, acknowledging that it's 9.45 p.m. Some of us have been here since abatement at 5.30 and wanted to be productive tonight. Um, I guess just personally, when I think of LOT, we have a couple conversations with local option tax. So um, one, when we frame this initially, these are all what Kane has outlined, part of the four categories we said, things we would use it on, capital expenses, payment of existing debt, economic development and community vitality, which specifically includes housing, um, and then municipal investments to generate long-term savings and efficiencies. That's something we all as the board agreed when we said we were gonna create LOT. So just to say these were all part of the like big bucket categories for local option tax spending. Um, and then I guess in terms of proportions, as Kane has proposed, we have um, a situation where we actually have local option tax revenue, or we're going to, for two quarters of this year um, that we didn't budget on because we didn't think it was going to be implemented until the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the budget. We have a question of how we spend it. We also then moving forward, we're going to have questions about how we spend local option tax every year and going into the 2025 budget process. I guess my question is, are we at all limiting our conversation tonight to this year's money, all the future money, and to housing and all the other things we can spend it on. I guess, again, just being up front for myself and wondering if, if there's some bounds for tonight in terms of input and, and outcomes we're hoping to see. Um, yeah, I, I think that we probably are talking about uh, 2024 LOT money. Um, because uh, the 2025 money will be part of our budget discussion uh, for next year. Um, and uh, I think one of the other concerns that was raised when we passed uh, the LOT was whether we were going to consider it as a separate uh, line item uh, or our revenue source uh, and not just part of general revenue. And I believe the consensus at the time was that we would uh, get uh, input uh, from the townspeople on how to prioritize that spending uh, and keep it separate, uh, separate uh, line of revenue. Um, so, um, with the uh, estimated, what would you say, 325,000 that we need? That's, that's plenty conservative, yeah. Three, 350. Well, that's my nature. <laughs> um, yeah, three three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars coming in this year. Then we do have some options for uh, possibly directing that money. Um, what uh, I'd be interested in hearing would be a little bit more about the uh, housing trust fund uh, and where it stands and what are the potential uses for that. For those funds, do you want to talk? Or? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk, and then we can hand it over to um, the chair of the housing task force. Um, where the housing trust stands is we've sure talked about it a lot, um, but we have not uh, made any sort of motion for creation of a housing trust, which should probably. We should probably put the horse before the wagon to create a housing trust before we fund one. Um, which is, I think, something that we can absolutely do in the next 10 minutes if the select board is in agreement. Okay. Uh, Joe, would you mind coming forward and discussing? Uh, the Hmm. Okay, uh, Mike, I'll get to you in a second, but we'll just ask Joe up in the meantime and uh, um, 
he's sideways now. How was that? Jim <laughs> <laughs> asked. Um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and uh, Joe will get to you uh, after we get Mike's comment. Just a brief comment. Um, at first, I was a little reluctant to uh, look at the local options tax, but I definitely got swayed until I saw the benefits of that. And I know I, as well as several of the other, well, I think all the other select board members have gotten comments from uh, local residents. Uh, I'm very hesitant, as much as I understand Kane's, what Kane is looking for, but to me, the local options tax, we, we need to look at the most flexibility. And I think the way the local options tax was sold was based upon an affordability, it was basically getting money from out-of-staters and visitors uh, to our community uh, to help defer some of the costs of running our municipality. And I think that's why a lot of uh, businesses and local people were for the options tax for, the, for those reasons. And I think to like pigeonhole set amounts or percentages to uh, spend on that, I just don't think is, is very prudent. I think we have to keep our, our options open, no pun intended, uh, and uh, look at what we can, you know, you know, on a yearly basis to select board based upon what the needs of the community will determine uh, where option tax money will go to. So I have to say, thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right. Um, Joe, uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, enlightening us a bit about uh, what the task force has done uh, as concerns the uh, uh, housing trust fund. So we, in general, we looked at this topic and you know, made the first recommendation to the select board that this was a good thing because it could impact affordability. And we put the question out there to say to get much more into detail, we, we needed to know a number. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was our first action. But then we did a, a little bit more research on this topic. And the first thing is, you know, a housing trust fund usually address, is used to address the issue of affordability of housing. Okay, and there's two aspects. One is the affordability of rentals, and the other is affordability of home ownership. Okay? And they both carry different price tags with them, if you will. Okay, we heard um, we heard the president from Down Street, I forget, um, who, yeah. Was, yeah, who presented to the select board last month, said that it's really difficult to to have to go after the home the affordability of home ownership because of the high cost of housing, of sale price as well as interest rates. Because usually what you're doing is looking at putting about 20% of the purchase price up. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it mm -hmm. gets into you know hundreds of thousands real quick. So we didn't really pursue that very much. We actually looked more at <clears throat> rentals. And in terms of what could be done, I think on the rental side, there's two things that could be done. Um, one is to support what the BHIP program is doing in, in terms of building additional capacity. And the VHIP program, for example, offers loans or grant up to, or grants actually up to, up to $50,000. And they just reported some numbers out um, on the success of that program, right? And what they reported was that the average grant was $44,000 to offset the price of a $500,000 ADU. So about 10%, right, of the, of the construction costs. Now, in return for that, it asked for um, a certain income based on the AMI, uh, the renter has to meet a certain certain income requirements in order to in order to be able to uh, rent that ADU. Okay, so that's how they address your initial affordability. Beyond that, what we've also seen though is several other before you get into the construction phase, you have to get into the planning phase, right? And we've also seen a number of other programs which kind of address more of the planning aspects that help individual property owners understand, does it make sense? How much will it cost me? Where could I build it out of my property? And they run anywhere from say two to $10,000, right? 
So we looked at the, you know, kind of taking that into account, we said, what would it take if we were looking at increasing our rental capacity in the township by 1%? Mm -hmm. So just 700 some rental units in the property, so say eight rental units, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of gives you a sense that it, it could cost anywhere from 100 to 400,000, depending on if you're doing planning or construction, if that were your goal. So that's where we have left it at. And um, ostensibly, uh, would uh, Downstreet uh, be in a position, like, like say we, I think uh, Tom mentioned, that there'd be a potential of using the housing trust fund to top up the uh, VHIP program uh, to accelerate uh, the addition of ADUs, uh, and would that be run by uh, Downstreet, or uh, how? What, what's the functionality of that uh, so, mechanism? So that program, so my understanding is as long as we stay consistent with the state's criteria, that's what Downstreet can do, and that's what they're doing for the city of Montpelier, right? Mm -hmm. um, the way that works- That's what they can do with very low administrative costs. Right, very low administrative costs. And the way that works is, you know, first someone would need to apply for the state funding. But if the state funding is overcommitted, which it has been, mm -hmm. right, then if the person was a resident of Waterbury, they would come to the housing trust fund mm -hmm. and ask for the funds from the housing trust fund. So first we use all the state's money, money up, and then when the state's money is gone, mm -hmm. we come to the housing trust fund. All right, other questions for Joe? Yeah, Alyssa. I guess one other, just to say, Joe, is we had um, the chair of the Heinsberg Housing Committee came to our last meeting on Thursday, and just his number one piece of advice, unsolicited by everyone, he gave an hour long presentation. Um, but he said, Our group, I wish our group had thought about raising sustainable funding sources to do this work regularly. And I guess the other piece that it's not part of the housing trust fund model, but like, you know, the town committed $100,000 of ARPA funding for the 51 South Main Street project. So there are folks who are working on subsidized housing projects being done by other developers and their, their town's housing committee took a role on supporting advocating for that funding. So just to say like there's other ways to spend money to support housing in addition to these models. Um, which is just interesting to hear you know, how another town is approaching it. I also think that, I just, and I, I haven't quite tracked this down, but I think many towns are also leveraging their investment in a housing trust fund to attract other funding, you know, be it mm -hmm. through government grants or even private donations and things like that. They are basically saying, you know, okay, the town put in this much money, can we get a grant in order to match that? Or, or they'll even go to private donors and ask them to do the same. So I don't know how administratively how that would be set up, but if it could be set up in a way that any private donors were able to get a, 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 a deduction for a contribution, we could begin to think about can we leverage the town's investment with other investments. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that the Housing Task Force uh, would look into further uh, over the next month? We could do that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know Windsor or Wind Windsor has something set up I, that is it's set up privately. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked at Montpelier has more money in their trust fund than was coming, they're only budgeting, I think, like $110,000, $150,000 out of their city budget. But the trust fund's being funded in other ways, and I think it might be through some community development grants or something like that mm -hmm. was coming in. Great. Senior, I will pick on you, but I wanted to see if there were other Just questions. Go ahead. One more. I was under the impression that in, in Montpelier that they um, those grants would be paid back to the town under the sale of the property. Is that still in consideration or not? We moved away from that. So usually when you do a home ownership, when you do support the home ownership, then yeah, usually then it's paid back you know, pay forward, I guess, if you would, right, it's revolving right. income that's paid back to the township. So, well, he's on the rehab ADU program. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. Okay. 
Right. Uh, any other questions for Joe? Thank you, I appreciate it. All right. Uh, Sandy, you got a question? Um, actually, it wasn't really a question, but okay. it's on the, we hit the, the Vermont housing, I was talking about the $50,000 grant. Right. It's a little bit more than that because it's not necessarily a grant now, it's a forgivable, forgivable loan. And your, um, before it was, you had five years, and if you didn't uh, have the lower uh, rate for your rental, um, then you had to pay it back. Well, mm -hmm. now it's a five-year or a ten-year forgivable loan. So every year they forgive that amount. And if you want the five-year loan, it has to be somebody through uh, Down Street that rents it. If you want to rent, like if you have an ADU where it's basically in your home, yeah. if you want somebody, you're still doing the rental at the lower rate, but if you want a family member or, or you know a friend or something like that, where you don't, if you can't, you have to go to ten years. So the ten-year investment on the lower rent is it's really hard. Uh -huh. I mean, especially when you're putting you know three hundred thousand dollars and you get fifty thousand. Yeah. I mean, ten years is a long time to get a lower income on that rental. Uh -huh. So it's not as easy as it used to be because last year it was $50,000 in five years and in the ADU you could have anybody but they don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot harder than it was and it's harder on people that want to have an ADU because I got the grant but I have to go 10 years hmm. because I wanted somebody that I knew in my right. home. No, it makes sense. Okay. okay. Um, as far as I understand it, as long as you are within the guidelines of the VHIP program as a municipality, if you're funding it or if you're a private organization, in funding in addition to the VHIP money, you know, it doesn't decrease. You're just adding on top of it as long as you meet their requirements. As long as, as, long as the project is meeting all the requirements, mm -hmm. if, you're give, if, say, the Housing Trust or the Housing Task Force was using some of its funding to fund a project that was also being funded by VHIP. There's no punishment from VHIP. You're just tacking on extra funds, which yeah. is good for people like Sandy, who now have extra money. Okay. Well, there is certain complexity right. to this, right? Uh, and maybe, uh, as you suggested, we could get started by calling for this thing to come into creation and then work out some of the details. Uh, as well as the funding levels that are going to be needed to meet immediate needs. Sure. Uh, so I would accept the motion. Yeah. I just wanted to talk to Ian's point. I think that's a really interesting detail to maybe suss out that some way, shape, or form, it's paid back. I think that makes the fund much more sustainable mm -hmm. and longer term and building upon it. And when you're giving free money. We looked at doing this for our property too. When you're giving free money to do this, now you're, you increase your property value exponentially as well. And your taxes. And, well, true, and your taxes. But when you go to sell, you've now made like extra, extra money, hopefully. That's the idea, right? Um, and so if there's some mechanism to be able to pay it back, I think that would be really smart and like long-term thinking. Well, it is in your deed too. You can't sell it the next person you sell it to has to stay with the program too. If it's within the, still within the window though, right? Yeah. Within the 10 years. Right, but if you sell it 12 years down the road, right. it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know, hold on. It's getting late. I don't know if we want to spend a lot more time on this at this moment. Um, do I have a motion uh, concerning the housing trust fund? I move that the town of Waterbury bring a housing trust fund into creation. I don't know how, are we starting a bank account? What are we doing? Oh, uh, not yet. Not to be a funder. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, should I, okay, well, if, I, if I'm rewording, allows, are we allowing the, Town of Waterbury to create a bank account for the purpose of a housing trust. What, like, how am I wording that? Yeah, Karen doesn't really want another bank account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how am I wording this? I think you simply need to 
create the fund and then okay. for 2024 at least determine if you want to put money into it. It doesn't mm -hmm. be a separate bank account. We can just account for it separately. See, I pictured this more glorious in my mind. But <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I move that the town of Waterbury create a housing trust fund. Just for Oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> so I have a second. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Mike, is that a hand? Uh, yes, no. Ooh, looks like he's working on something. If I give him this, this mic. We can hear you, Mike. Mike, we can hear you. He's trying to, this pool is trying to unmute. I was just trying to hit the button, not wave, and that guy had to say anything. Okay. So I could vote. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I think that was an aye in favor, right? Yes. In aye in favor. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We have created a trust fund, and we will take this up uh, with uh, added information going forward uh, to uh, address it. Also, part of what we didn't really address was uh, debt relief. Uh, we can also perhaps address that. And then some not not really a matter. Yeah. All right, uh, next is uh, the change to town meeting format. First discussion. Um, and uh, you put all the, the super heavy stuff right at the end. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm the, the one that uh, created this uh, line item, but I have been impressed with uh, what Duxbury has done in terms of increasing the uh, participation uh, in town meeting. Uh, they have a, a meeting in January where you can actually have a discussion and get uh, voter input on funding priorities uh, before uh, the town meeting gets warned, and then they do an Australian ballot at town meeting. Now, I know that uh, there are also a lot of people that are hold very dearly to the uh, town meeting format that we've been doing for the last uh, 263 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's time to reopen that discussion. Other comments? Okay. I think the meeting in and of itself is entirely important to American democracy, but I think that the voting can move to paper ballot is my opinion about town meeting. Mm -hmm. And we do have paper ballot for elements of town meeting. Right. Other comments or suggestions? Alyssa. I mean, I just think part of the reason this was on tonight's very uh, packed agenda, and at least I liked your, this is a, a list of the top 10 most pressing select word <laughs> items all today. Come here August 19th, you'll hear it all. Um, it's just, I think Kane made the point at the last meeting that if we want to have this conversation now, I mean, if we're changing the format, we have to have an in-person town meeting to get rid of a floor vote town meeting if that's how we desire. So just recognizing we hit December, January, and we're kind of full steam ahead with budgeting. So if there was not wanting to get on that track, we need to start having that conversation sooner to now. Mm -hmm. I think we've had it on the agenda, I'm going to say within the calendar year, but not directly. And there's folks who feel strongly in both camps. I'm with you, Roger. I think a way that could bring more folks in would be really valuable because I love it. I mean, I love the meeting tonight. I cringed a little when we held up hands for the road because we didn't say, like, come vote on the future of your road tonight, right. you know? And so it really is that, like, how do we create that stakes for folks to show up? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lisa? In 2021, when Duxbury had their decision making around this they wanted to make a decision to change their town meeting for the following march right. um 
actually no, it was 2022, there was the general election in November and they called a special town meeting the week after that. And it was at that following week um, meeting that they had their special town meeting to discuss the format. It, I was at it, it went on for hours, um, just like town meeting. Um, and that was the decision that they made in person that, that night to then um, vote to change it to Australian ballot in March mm -hmm. um, and set the Citizens Have Your Say Day for the first Saturday in January. And so that went into motion. So then when January rolled around, they had their first um, you know, January meeting with Pi and, and, this, and the town budget draft. Um, mm -hmm. It meant the select board had their budget draft by the beginning of January to then do a line by line conversation at that meeting. Right. Um, and then they had just the Australian ballot vote in March. But mm -hmm. their, their town meeting that they had, and it was, they probably had about 120 people show up for it. It was a week after the general election. Um, people thought that maybe there wouldn't be interest, but there was. Mm -hmm. Um, and they probably talked about it for two hours, um, mm -hmm. and it was well attended. So, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've received similar feedback from uh, the uh, Duxbury Select Board, um, and what attracted me to it was that it actually is a pretty functional uh, opportunity for people to weigh in on line items, which you can't do at town meeting. It's right. either up or down. And if it's down, then you know, they throw everything back. And I've been to the two, and they've had a very detailed presentation where the select board walks through. They have it printed. It's all handouts. People will go through page by page. They talk about each section, each department, et cetera. Um, people ask a lot of questions. Um, how come this is up? How come this is down? Interestingly, they've done this for two years. Um, there have been no changes. <laughs> As a result of that, it starts off where people might have, you know, say, why is it this or why is it? But then once they hear the explanation, they're good with it. Mm -hmm. um, so in both cases, the two years they've done this, the select board has then had another meeting after that where they say, well, this is, that's the meeting where we would make any adjustments before we approve it for the, the ballot, um, for the warning. And they haven't made any changes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been a good, a good, you know, hour and a half probably discussion of the budget at, at those Saturday meetings. I would welcome that. I yeah. think I think one of the challenges first I, I guess we'll just say like this is not a town manager statement, personal statement. I think they kinda of hit the nail on the head because they mm -hmm. preserved the tradition and gave it the Australian ballot and mm -hmm. right. I think that's great. But but what I struggle with the town meeting day is the the procedure and the resolutions and the need to amend these hundred word resolutions about the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, oh well we're amending this to say this and then you know it's gotta be read eighteen times. And I think people get lost in that in the in, in the in the bureau, you know bureaucracy that goes with that. And at some point, you know, last year there were some who just raised their hand and said, What again are we voting on? Because we had this motion mm -hmm. and then we had to vote to amend the motion and Rebecca Ellis has gone hoarse because she's had to <laughs> read this three hundred word motion five times and I think at some point a community conversation just simplifies that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's much more informal. Mm -hmm. uh, their town moderator is present for that and kind of runs the, the meeting as just to sort of keep things moving and, and keep order and call people to speak and that sort of thing. But there's not, you know, they're not proposing motions and they're not voting on anything. There's no voting. Um, and it's, it, it moves the conversation along. But it's, it's much more one-on-one -on -one where people just raise their hand and ask the select board chair a question and they answer it. Um, and they also, the town clerk is able to then talk to the people about what offices are on the ballot. Um, and, you know, there's people are there signing petitions for the candidates because um, it's January and they've got still a couple weeks to do that. So, anyway, it's very town meeting like. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of pie. <laughs> I support the pie. Yeah, I'm yeah. a big, big fan of the pie. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Mike. Call me old school. And I old do school. I, am old. I will. <laughs> I am old school, but I do believe in the tradition of a traditional town meeting. I do don't think that even if you have an informational meeting, 
you don't have the ability to change things, and I think that's really important. I get highly embarrassed by our electorate, as we've seen last week, where we've had a 15% participation in our primary elections. I think that's an embarrassment. People don't want to participate. And just because people don't want to show up to town meeting, you know, and if they're not educated on the issues, I don't think that makes for a better democracy. I think traditional town meeting is something precious in our state of Vermont. It makes our state very unique and plus, I think it, it helps our community and people, if they're concerned, we have seen time and time again, when there's critical issues, the auditorium is packed with people. When people are, con uh, people are concerned about something, and you see, once that issue is done, they're out the door. And I just think it's for us to discuss issues as a community, I think it is critical um, to have a democracy, to have a better community. I think just by having more votes doesn't make it better. I think the personal opinion, I'll label as such. Thanks. Okay. Just uh, one point of correction. I believe our uh, voting tally was 31% uh, uh, during the uh, primary. Uh, which may not be acceptable, but it's still 115. Um, okay. Well, we've got some input here. Uh, Ian. Yeah, I just want to say I, I am in full support of this idea. I think we have a town with a hunger for involvement, as we've seen um, you know, at every one of our meetings here. And I think this just increases transparency um, in, our, in, our, uh, in our government, and I am in full support of that. So it seems like uh, next steps would be to decide, maybe not here and now, but uh, going forward, if we want to have a special town meeting uh, in November in order to make this, get, get uh, the town to weigh in on this issue. Karen, do you want to have a special town meeting in November? <laughs> yeah, that sounds exciting. I wasn't if anybody was going to ask me what I thought about this idea. <laughs> You're all circling the table here. Um, at 1016 tonight, I don't have the energy to think about having a special town meeting in November. Um, I guess I'll need to look at a calendar. It doesn't have to be November. Right. I, yes, with all due respect, I have, I have some pretty crazy deadlines right after any election as far as reporting and, and doing election night results and official reports and stuff. So. I might need more than a week after a presidential election to, to have a special town meeting, and I'd have to find a location to do it, um, which means working with the school, unless you're having this on a Saturday as well, which means we're talking about compensation, because I didn't sign up for Saturdays <laughs> for free forever. So there's a Just lot sign of layers up for Monday to nights that. until uh, <laughs> 10, yeah, 10 well, that one came Sorry, who's job, running the agenda? And yeah. it is. Oh. So, we'll get one. so I've got a, f a few thoughts about it, to say okay. the least, a couple of things. All right. so. Well, um, but I'm not opposed to the idea. While I appreciate Mike and others who really love the idea of town meeting, I think that the I think that the model that Duxbury has used is is a nice. A nice one, and that's that's the one I would say to move towards. Okay. May I ask? A yes. Question? Actually, this question is directed at Lisa because I don't know the answer, and you've been to Duxbury town meetings. Um, do they still hold like a gathering on the day of town meeting? No. 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 Drive through voting. Drive through voting. Oh. They just they did that. They started that during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and they've kept it. And their turnout for Every vote since they've started that has been the highest of all the towns in our school district, mm -hmm. where they get the most participation with their drive-through voting. It's been they've they've taken to it. That I'm not doing. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's, and it's, it's been under all conditions. They've had hot weather. Mm -hmm. They've had cold weather. I remember had last time meeting day. Snow. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they they've got their booths made and they have a system mm -hmm. set up and they. The parking lot's not even paved. 
it's not. <laughs> they just set up a loop, and um, they, it, it's 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 quite a, a they've got it down to a system now. But um, no, everything is just on the, that Saturday, and that Saturday morning, it's usually just until noon. About they're they're done. It starts at nine, um, and they have breakfast. The historical society does the breakfast that where people bring pies. They have coffee and. Um, and there's other community groups. It's like a town meeting. People set up tables mm -hmm. with the land trust, and the you know different committees have like uh, the ambulances there with their road signs and um, tables for people to have information booths and all that kind of stuff. Just like a town meeting. Um, and then they go through their agenda with the, the presentations about the budget, about the candidates that are going to be on the, the ballot in March. Mm -hmm. There's the state representatives come and. You know, talk about the upcoming legislative session because it's at the beginning of the, the, the session. Um, they answer questions. Um, there's a, anybody else who wants to make a presentation? Um, they had a whole discussion about um, openings of the cemetery commission that were going to be on the ballot, and cemetery commissioners stood up and talked about what they did, and then four or five people raised their hands saying they were interested in running for the cemetery commission. Um, and the select board chair was concerned that the, the lead of the story that I was going to write was going to be more about the competition for the cemetery. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Um, but they, you know, people were, you know, were very engaged in that, and I think they realized that the the trade off was that come town meeting day, you just do an Australian ballot um, for the budget, and you know, the, and the select board was open to making changes in that draft at that point. Um, but by the time they got through the whole conversation, there was nobody requesting that they change anything. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it might be it might be bad for tradition, but it sounds like it's really good for democracy. So there is there's your trade. Mm -hmm. can, can you, if you have a hybrid meeting, in your informational meeting, can things be changed at all? Yes. It's, is it just information or can you, you know, I had before a hybrid meeting, if you can at that meeting sort of present possible amendments to, you know, what's, what's the worn agenda? I think that's the whole point, right? It's not done yet. It's yeah. still a draft. That's, yeah. That is the point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the point is I was... Like, I shudder on the stage. I don't want someone making an amendment motion on the budget because it gets hard and messy and scary at town meeting day that are we going to pass something versus if there's the ability to have that real stakes weighing in earlier, um, mm -hmm. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. I cut you off. Is Duxbury hybrid? I'm not sure what he means by hybrid. I think he means on Zoom. Oh, I ask him. Or maybe <laughs> ballot and. Uh, are you talking about Zoom, Mike? When you ask about a hybrid meeting. No, right? I'm talking like the hybrid meeting would be the informational meeting beforehand. I, I think to manage a Zoom meeting and a town meeting would just be chaos. Okay, I didn't mean that. You, you can't know, have a Zoom town meeting. The uh, right. free meeting. Be you know, <laughs> I. If, if there was some way to potentially make changes to the budget, I think that's a good alternative. That you could then present that, you know, via an Australian ballot. But if you can, that's where I think town meeting does have its place to potentially, because I have seen a lot of good amendments come forth at town meeting that makes the budget better. Duxbury allows for that. I think yeah, so that's uh, that's where. Well, go ahead, Tom. They they do they do allow. I mean, they invite comments on the budget, and they can amend it during the meeting. And that's, I believe they've said at their meetings that they they essentially will not necessarily rely on, on the select board, but but the will of the people. If the people want to amend the budget, the select board will will essentially honor that. I don't know if they wrote that into the, the rules. Per se, but that's something to explore. I could go back and find their their information sheet where they explain that. I have that. Um, they still have several weeks though before they have to approve the warning for town meeting day. So it's in that interim then that they could go back and tinker with the draft that they presented on that Saturday. Should there be things that they that come up that they want to change as a result of the feedback? But in the two years they've done this, there hasn't been any significant feedback where they've 
had a subsequent had meeting that they had to make a change. It's mm -hmm. kind of how select boards and school boards all the time tell the public, don't come to us on at the end and tell us you want to change it. There's a whole process that happens. It starts mm -hmm. in December, and we should be coming then when we're having these discussions and, and weighing in then. And so it's kind of, it shifts it so that that is happening earlier when there still is that time right. to, before it's, it has to be set in stone. Billy Victor. So one thing I think would be important to do is to find a way to communicate what changes are made. Because when we did this in the phase one bylaws and we made changes, one of the things we were unable to do because there were so many changes is find a simple way to say to people, you came to all these meetings, this is what we changed. And you, in a real budget vote, you have to, if you made changes, you have to be able to explain it very clearly to people that when they came, we changed it so they know what they're voting on. But they, can, differences. they can say that before the meeting adjourns. Yeah. But you have to get, I mean, it's a budget. This could be There's a great communicator right. over here. <laughs> Just, I, I think you have to be pretty careful. I, I think you have to be pretty precise about showing the changes so people knew what was changed after the meeting. So they knew what they voted for. Right. I, don't think it, I don't think it's hard. I, well, conceptually, it's not hard. I think practically, how to say these 19 lines in the budget were changed in the following way, that's hard. They haven't had that come up yet, so I, I'm not sure how they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. I have more confidence mm -hmm. in this town to make changes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so Lisa is going to get us a little bit more clarity yeah. on uh, how the, the whole thing is put together. Uh, yeah, Evan. Uh, I just want to say I think moving it to a different day of the week is a great idea. Uh, Mike said something a few minutes ago about people not wanting to come to town meeting, and I don't think that's necessarily the issue. I wanted to go to town meeting, but I have to work on Tuesday morning. So, right, that is to a lot of weekend. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's state workers, and very few other people get the day off. So, uh, that's, that's definitely a consideration. Um, all right, I don't know if we need to vote on anything right now, but uh, I'm getting a, sort of a semi-positive mood on, on entertaining some changes here. Except for over here on the left. Um, so, uh, next, uh, how about uh, moving on to uh, looking at uh, the agenda for our next meeting? Yeah, that's a good long time for the handbook. Like this, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, you've got a new member of got the D, the R, and the A. What can I say? <laughs> yes. yes. I'm sorry, I was quiet. I said, was there also interest in the after action report? For From crew. From crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you see um, Liz's uh, question to me about two different formats for the accurate report? Um, yes, but I'm not recalling your response. My response is none, because they haven't made one yet. Uh, I spent some time opening up those things and trying to figure out what the difference was. Um, but uh, if you had a preference, I would go with that. Okay, I can look at it. I thought okay. what Danny did last year was effective and worthwhile if they wanted to. I just wasn't sure which one was hers. So if you wanted to make that recommendation to Liz, that would be great. Uh, so we'll have after action report. Uh, anything else from this meeting? Maybe a continuation of uh, local option tax talk. Mm -hmm. So is that the division of local option tax allocation that's in the parking lot? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. If we want to do like debt and such, yeah. Yeah, because we didn't hear much about debt, and I do think it's an important consideration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to continue the town meeting day conversation? I do. I think so too. Okay. For the um, going back to the to the crew and the natural disaster committee, do you want to have a conversation about funding for? crew and or future floods? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it would be great if we could get the principles from both the uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee and
crew uh, to have some discussion as to what crew is prepared to do and what the natural disaster the, the committee is prepared to do? Yeah, the, the committee will meet before this meeting. They meet on the 26th. Six, I think. Yeah, the 26th. Um, and we should have that handbook. And I know they're going to be talking about volunteer, the volunteer core, putting, putting that together. So we should have something for you. Right. So do you think that's at this meeting or at the meeting? At they can definitely the deliver the handbook at this next meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think a preliminary discussion of this that. would be great. Mm -hmm. Preliminary uh, discussion about response or About or the, the next response and uh, where, where do we go knocking? Uh, find people interested in organizing what needs to be organized. Yeah. Okie dokie. Roger, you mentioned other community flood input. Does it feel like we should do other follow-up there or stick it as part of the after action? Or I guess wait until we have the grant. I'm just thinking, like, again, this thing, and I wasn't trying to be facetious with my motion, Tom, but the, like, we're submitting this mega grant application, and I still think we need something on the website or someplace. Mm -hmm. You know, we had community members here tonight saying, I don't think my neighborhood is being accounted for, which is, like, real and important, and I just don't know where we're keeping that list of kind of like what's going, I mean, it's hard, I'll say it's hard for me as a select board member, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty deeply in this stuff, but. Um, I, I can I can upload something tomorrow. Oh, I, yeah, and I think this is maybe we don't need it as an agenda item. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, and, I, and you and I had a sort of a side conversation about this, because uh, from my perspective, the meeting we had at the firehouse felt like sort of an initial meeting, mm -hmm. where we're just sort of understanding who this community is and how everyone's affected and what ideas they have. And we finished going around the circle and report it out, but we don't have any clear action as to how do we take this information and uh, make it actionable. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we try to maybe make group decisions let's just say for the sake of argument about Randall and Elm Street as a, a neighborhood and is it possible for those to, for us to make decisions about our priorities uh, in terms of mitigation buyouts etc mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a lot but uh, it, it felt like we identified a group that was interested in talking to one another about these issues, and I'm just wondering, is there another step? And I'm addressing you just because it's sort of your business to uh, facilitate this type of meeting. There is a next step. My question is, we might, in the interest of how well I do at late night meetings, should it be the meeting after? I'm just saying, if we have the handbook, we have the after action, we have this preliminary discussion of who's doing what, does it feel like? The next meeting would be the time to a discussion say, this is where everyone landed. I'm, I mean, we're in a public meeting, and I will say this publicly. I don't know how putting the heads of crew, the heads of crew, and the heads of the disaster preparedness committee are going is going to go. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know how that how that meeting is going to go. But we didn't know how uh, Shaw Mansion was going to go, and uh, we found out. So I mean, I think it's important uh, because. It is hurricane season. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we're only on E, and there's a lot left in the uh, There's another one forming right now on exactly. the African Horn. Every moment, there are butterflies dancing in <laughs> Africa. Like, uh, <laughs> Factual. Okay. Factual. <laughs> but uh, so it, it's, it's important that, that yes. we move the process right. forward. Right. Uh, and so I, I think, as uncomfortable as that may, may be, it's an important discussion to have. Okay. And we can also three-legged stool it and call it response roles and just do a quick overview of like this is the town, this is the emergency, mm -hmm. this is this committee, this is mm -hmm. room. You know, it doesn't need mm -hmm. to just be. And by the same token, uh, I don't think that we need to have maybe the answer on how to move that forward, but I'd love to get some ideas 
on how, what would be a responsible way of getting neighborhoods to be able to weigh in on what they see as the future of their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And speaking of our friends Duxbury, they have neighborhood captains for emergency response. By the way, everyone, that's what I wanted our friends to do. Those neighborhood, do those neighborhood captains live in those neighborhoods? Yes, and then their Same responsibility sense. is to report back to one individual human about how their neighborhood is doing. Anyway, cool model. Um, I like that model, too. Yeah. yeah. Try not to reinvent the wheel here. I have uh, four <laughs> items for yep. next time after okay. action report from crew. Yeah. Uh, crew and future floods. Division of local options allocation in the town meeting day format second discussion. Nice. Did I miss something? I think we just might want to tweak the wording a little. But okay. they're mm -hmm. dead. Uh, did you get LOT? Uh, yeah. yeah. Division of division. local options yeah. tax yeah. allocation. Yeah. Okay. Does that does that uh, it can it be emergency response roles, colon, town, comma. Disaster response roles. Oh Lord, now you have punctuation. Yeah. Disaster response. <laughs> Say it again. Uh, we were wondering about disaster, <laughs> like preliminary. This one's getting punchy. I could. We're all getting punchy. It's fine. This is wordsmithing. I can do it after. Okay. But all right, you send it to me. Or that weird time. little section states legal s. You should put that in there too. Okay. May I ask okay. a quick question about the second discussion of the town meeting day format? Um, what What do you need from me to have that second discussion? <coughs> Do you need dates in mind? Do you need to know I am I am not a party <coughs> planner by nature? So Do I, I need think, a location? I Ooh, think dates and location. And I think dates and process. So what's what's the process, the, the timeline to warrant a special town meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just so that um, it may be premature to be talking about dates, but at least the, no, the select I, board can know if it's a thirty day warning then yeah. Um, and then I can work with Lisa, who's graciously volunteered, and get some detail about what exactly Duxbury proposed. Mm -hmm. And I can also just talk to council in general and get some better understanding of guidelines there. Sure. I think the interesting question is, from the Duxbury model, is is the budget amendment, is an amendment from the floor of a draft budget legally binding? Well, the amendment from is the floor are legally binding. I thought we that, weren't voting on anything. No, but if, at the pre-town meeting when the budget is presented, mm -hmm. if, if the residents of the town vote to amend the budget, is there is that a legally binding mechanism? Well, would, I thought you said there's no voting. Would yeah, they, well, they the select board would vote. The select board would vote, but it, but there's an iterative process. I'm mm -hmm. noting that's different. Mm -hmm. Right now, if someone stands up in the JMA town meeting day and makes a motion, mm -hmm. it is legally binding. Right. Versus if Evan stood up right now and made a motion, we would say, that's so nice, Evan. We'll take it under advisement. <laughs> right. But we ultimately have the authority. I, yeah. I think I get it. I think yeah. I understand what you're asking. So right. you'll find out the legalities of it. I'll mm -hmm. do timeline and mm -hmm. potential yeah. location. And, and, and I, think, I think what I'm suggesting is, you know, it, it may be legally binding if you choose it to be. Right, right. right. Yeah, it sounds from what Lisa was describing is that they're not voting, they're just ex getting the general yeah. will of the people, uh, trying to get a, a sense of what the recommendation from the public is, and then the select board goes back and tweets it based on yeah. feedback. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for your point, we could honor it as if it was whether or not we right. want to. Um, I think we got enough uh, for next meeting. Okay. Sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> Wasn't much argument there. <laughs> do I have uh, a motion uh, uh, concerning uh, the need to enter an executive session? I move to enter executive session for the purposes of discussion of contracts and invite the municipal manager. Second. Nice. All in favor say aye. 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 aye.